Director of Multidisciplinary ICU from MGM Healthcare, uh, Chennai. Uh, he started his career as a critical care uh, medicine uh, general medical officer, then get uh, transformed into anesthesiologist, then into uh, the critical care physicians. He got enormous training in various uh, 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 areas, especially she got trained in UK for many long years and very passionate towards critical care uh, medicine. I know her from her postgraduate uh, days, how much she's uh, dedicated to critical care, an ideal person to deliver uh, this lecture. Uh, over to you, Aarti, to start with your lecture on hemodynamic monitoring. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so at the outset, I thank the organizing committee uh, for this opportunity. So uh, let me go into the talk. So good morning, everyone. <clears throat> uh, my topic uh, today is about invasive hemodynamic monitoring with emphasis on arterial lines uh, in the sense arterial blood pressure monitor, central venous pressure monitoring, and pulmonary artery catheter monitoring. So why do we bother about this invasive hemodynamic monitoring? So at the outset, we need to understand the hemodynamic instability, whatever the cause may be, is called as a circulatory shock. So this circulatory shock leads to many complications. So patients who survive the initial phase of shock with respect to even in critical care or perioperative period may then go into what is called as multi-organ failure, secondary to microcirculatory dysfunction, which is a major cause of late death if this circulatory disturbance is not addressed appropriately. Hence, we need to monitor the hemodynamics to assess the global and regional tissue perfusion to prevent hypoperfusion and hence to prevent circulatory shock and hence to prevent the long-term and short-term morbidity and mortality. So appropriate and early application of diagnostic information from hemodynamic monitoring has been shown to reduce mortality with respect to shock. So coming to a uh, specific emphasis on surgical patients, we talk about a lot of hemodynamic monitoring in critical care patients where we know that the patients are critically ill with a lot of uh, multiple reasons for their circulatory dysfunction and uh, extensive comorbids. So with the special emphasis uh, for surgical patients, the surgical patients are high risk for hemodynamic instability because they are increased risk of hypoperfusion, secondary to vena cable compression due to positive pressure ventilation and reduction in the muscle tone causing redistribution of blood flow secondary to drugs used during anesthesia and also the compensatory mechanism to maintain normothermia to compensate for starvation and secondary to inflammatory response causes increase in oxygen consumption at the outset of decrease in the deliveries. So these uh, uh, situations uh, put the patient in a very high risk position uh, leading on to circulatory disturbance. So why are we worried about these circulatory disturbances is that they cause secondary organ dysfunction like myocardial infarction, stroke, renal failure and bowel ischemia. So hemodynamic monitoring should include a combination of clinical examination, monitoring devices, and laboratory results. The focus is always about the patient, not the technology. In practice, the monitoring devices are employed in series of increasingly invasive and complex steps depending upon the clinical examination and patient's response to the treatment. So the recent fluid challenge and intensive care trial indicated that there is a considerable gap between knowledge about the benefits of advanced hemodynamic monitoring based on optimization and actual clinical practice. So wh whom do we call uh, patients are high-risk patients with respect to surgical are patients with previous severe cardiorespiratory illness like acute myocardial infarction, chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary diseases or patients with history of stroke and uh, patients who have vascular diseases involving the major vessels old age patients uh, more than 70 years with limited physiological reserve, patients who undergo extensive surgeries like esophagectomy, gastrectomies, and acute abdominal patients with uh, peritonitis or perforated viscous, patients who have massive blood loss, patients who have septicemia, sepsis, and septic shock features, mm -hmm. patients who are having respiratory failures and acute renal failures. So all these patients are 
uh, high risk surgical patients and high risk patients in critical care units where we need to monitor or them in an invasive methodology. So I'm going to talk about uh, three uh, monitors, arterial line monitoring, central venous pressure monitoring, and pulmonary artery catheterization. So going, coming into the arterial blood pressure monitoring, arterial blood pressure monitoring is a cornerstone of hemodynamic assessments. So the definition of low arterial pressure is patient-specific and always interpreted in the context of patient's usual blood pressures. So what are the indications uh, of arterial monitoring are patients who are having unstable blood pressures or who are anticipated to have unstable blood pressures, patients who are in severe hypotension and who needs rapidly acting vasoactive drugs like vasodilators, vasopressors, and inotropes, and also for frequent sampling purposes, patients with severe hypertension and other supportive devices like intraiotic balloon pump, and patients with unreliable and difficult to obtain invasive blood pressure. So these are all the current indications for invasive arterial blood pressure monitoring. There's another the upcoming indications for arterial blood pressure monitoring is monitoring of systolic pressure variation or pulse pressure variation with respect to the arterial waveform analysis uh, in patients who are mechanically ventilated. And this is an important step in assessment of preload and fluid responsiveness, which I will be talking about shortly. So we uh, just to brush about the arterial uh, systems, I'm not going to go into the details, just going to brush the knowledge. So it is an um, catheter which is inserted into an arterial axis, either in the radial, brachial, femoral, et cetera, where it is uh, connected to the fluid transducer system. And that system has a sensitive pressure sensitive diaphragm, which is uh, transmits the pressure changes into the monitor. And this is connected to the pressurized uh, flush bag with a pressure about 200 to 300 millimeters of mercury. So to prevent clots and to prevent convenient meaning of uh, testing the fast flush test. We need to know about uh, certain uh, specific parameters with respect to arterial uh, blood pressure monitoring. So uh, those are a few uh, definitions which we need to understand before going into the assessment. Uh, so dynamic response is an important ability of the arterial system to accurately reproduce the patient's hemodynamic waveform. So that depends upon two things. One is the resonant frequency, another is the damping coefficient. So the resonant frequency of the system is the frequency at which the system oscillates when it is stimulated. Okay, the resonant frequency is also called as the natural frequency of the system, and it has to be greater than the highest frequency of the incoming pulsatile arterial blood pressure signals, otherwise the waveforms will be exaggerated or it will be damped. So for example, uh, if uh, the natural frequency is greater than 20 hertz, which is normally we expect it to be, so that it can faithfully reproduce the arterial pressures uh, with a frequency of heart rates between 120 to 60 beats per minute, that is between 2 hertz to 1 hertz. Uh, so what is damping coefficient? Damping coefficient refers to how quickly this oscillating arterial fluid filled system comes to rest. So the system with high damping coefficient will diminish the arterial waveforms and the system with a low damping coefficient will exaggerate the signals. So how do we assess the dynamic response of an arterial system is using a fast flush test. So a fast flush test is to briefly open up the uh, fast flush system to produce a squared waveform. So this, uh, uh, you can see the diagram there. The first one represents the optimally damped system where the, after the squared waveform, you get one or two uh, oscillations and under damped systems have more than two oscillations and an over damped system have less than 1.5 oscillations after the squared wave test. So overdamp systems uh, where uh, the reasons being uh, presence of air bubbles, kickings or clots in the pressurizing tubing system or even the loose connections or a, a compliant uh, tubing. So all these things will cause overdamping of the system and also the underinflated pressure bag. If the pressure bag is less than uh, uh, the pressure 300 millimeters of mercury, this also causes overdamping of the system. So what happens with the overdamping is that the blood pressures are read falsely low. Systolic blood pressure is falsely low and the diastolic blood pressure is falsely high. The mean arterial pressures are usually not changed. And with this... Um, uh, analysis of the uh, arterial waveform, the diacrotic notch is diminished or absent with respect to the overdamped arterial system. 
Coming to the underdam system, the causes could be a compliant tubing where the natural frequency is exactly equal to the uh, signals transmitted by the arterial system and uh, usually results in overshoot of the systolic pressures causing vibration and spikes. So, uh, so that's the same thing. So these are all the various uh, definitions we need to understand with respect to arterial blood pressure monitoring. So coming to the invasive hemodynamic monitoring with respect to the arterial uh, blood pressure monitoring, we have important parameter what is called as pulse pressure variation. So pulse pressure variation is a difference between the arterial systolic and diastolic pulse pressure, uh, diastolic pressure, and uh, that's that's the definition of the pulse pressure. So pulse pressure variation refers to the difference between the maximum pulse pressure and the minimum pulse pressure over a single mechanical breath. So this pulse pressure variation is analyzed with respect to patients on positive pressure ventilation. So to document the inspiratory and expiratory, respiratory waveform should always be simultaneously analyzed when you are assessing for a pulse pressure variation with an arterial waveform. So pulse pressure variation can be calculated manually or automatically. So these are other uh, calculations uh, which is done manually. So almost all uh, advanced monitors have automatic devices to calculate the pulse pressure variation. So pulse pressure variations of more than 13% has been shown to be specific and sensitive indicator for preload responsiveness. It's almost 90% specific and sensitive with respect to preload responsiveness. So uh, wh what do we uh, normally see? The principle behind is that the pulse pressure reflects the left ventricular stroke volume, which indirectly reflects the cardiac output, which indirectly uh, reflects the hemodynamic status of the patient. So this is one of the dynamic indices which we monitor the pulse pressure variation and also the stroke volume variation. It is derived from what is called as heart-lung interaction during the positive pressure ventilation. So what, uh, what happens during a positive pressure ventilation is that during the positive pressure ventilation, the vena cava is compressed, preload is decreased in fluid responsive patients, decrease, which results in decrease in the stroke volume, and hence, decrease in the pulse pressure during inspiration. A patient is defined as fluid responders if the decrease is greater than 13% from the baseline with respect to pulse pressure and more than 14% with respect to systolic pressure variation or stroke volume variation. A patient is defined as non-fluid responders if the stroke volume variation or the pulse pressure variation is less than 9%. And there is always a gray zone between these two numbers, 9 to 13%, where the clinician have to take a decision with respect to the clinical manifestations or move on to a different modality of invasive hemodynamic monitoring. So uh, looking at the picture, uh, the uh, picture A represents a pulse pressure variation in a non-fluid responding patient and uh, B represents the pulse pressure change in a fluid responsive patients. So uh, with uh, that with respect to the arterial blood pressure monitoring. So coming to the contraindications for uh, arterial uh, uh, blood pressure monitoring is anticipated thrombolytic therapy, patients with severe peripheral vascular diseases preventing catheter insertion and vascular anomalies like local aneurysms or hematomas and lack of collateral blood flows. Uh, for example, when the ideal artery has been used for a previous coronary artery bypass grafting. So coming to the central venous pressure monitoring. So central venous pressure is often considered as a good index of volume status. However, there is strong evidence of poor correlation between the CVP tracing and the patient volumic status or fluid response. But still we use central venous pressure monitoring in both surgical and critically ill patients because um, of the following reasons. So the CVP is not a good responder for fluid responsiveness because it is influenced by many other factors like the peripheral vascular tone, right ventricular compliance, pulmonary vascular resistance, and in uh, patients who are ventilated, it doesn't reflect the uh, right blood pressure. It is usually on the higher side. So CVP can be a useful indicator as an upper threshold at which stopping fluid therapy. For example, a positive trend reaching a higher value may inform the clinician that there is no more need for fluid replacement. And it should not be considered as an absolute target of fluid therapy. So elevated CVP does not necessarily indicate adequate preload and should not prevent a fluid challenge if indicated. 
So what are the indications of central venous catheter insertion is to measure the central venous pressures, infusions of vasoactive drugs, and uh, patients uh, who are hemodynamically unstable uh, and who are undergoing major surgical procedures, and inability to obtain a peripheral vascular axis, and use for hemodialysis, plasma exchange, and transmitter spacing. So relative contraindications would be severe coagulopathy, anticipated thrombolytic therapy, and infection of the overlying site, and thrombosis of the superior vena cavae or the subclavian vein. So normal central venous pressures around 0 to 5 millimeters of mercury in a spontaneously breathing patients, and the upper limit of normal would be 10 millimeters of mercury in a mechanically ventilated patients. And a CVP of more than 15 millimeters is always pathological. So it could be either it could be volume overload, it could be a right ventricular failure, or it could be secondary due to cord pulmonale, congestive cardiac failure, or it could be even due to central attention pneumothorax. So CVP should not be regarded as a single parameter. It always has to be guided with the clinical condition of a patient and trend of CVP analysis has to be done. So uh, just to brush up the knowledge, CVP tracing has uh, three positive waves and two negative deflections, A wave, C wave, and B waves. So A wave is due to atrial contraction. It is normally lost during atrial fibrillation and canon A waves are present during junction rhythms or uh, third degree heart block or ventricular tachycardia. C waves uh, is because of, uh, it happens during the early systolic bulging of the tricuspid valve during the um, ventricular contraction and uh, Tricuspid regurgitation causes fusion of C and V waves causing and blunting of the X descent. And V wave is secondary to the rapid filling of the right atrium. And in tricuspid regurgitations, V wave is prominent. And um, so just to, uh, so in atrial fibrillation, that is loss of uh, A waves. And in tricuspid regurgitation, that is prominent V waves. And uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, ventricular premature contraction, that is uh, canon A waves. And uh, in uh, pressure overload, that is fusion of uh, complexes with the prominent A waves and steep X descent. So now coming to uh, pulmonary artery catheters. Pulmonary artery catheters are seven French catheters, which is normally the length ranging from 90 to 110 centimeter long, used for right heart catheterization. So there are different models of pulmonary artery catheters. So these are basic thermodilution models where you measure, these catheters are used to measure the right atrial pressure, pulmonary artery pressure, pulmonary artery occlusion pressures without uh, intermittent thermodilution or cardiac output measurements. So this is a basic uh, the basic model, which just measures the right heart pressures and pulmonary artery occlusion pressures. The other model, which include addition of infusion ports, where there are lumens which open into the right atrium or the right ventricle, uh, along with the measurement of the pressures, they are also used for continuous drug infusions and uh, fluid infusions. And there are models which aid in measuring cardiac output uh, continuously. So this includes measurements of right atrial pressure, pulmonary arterial pressure, occlusion pressure, along with a thermal filament with a catheter tip that would continuously provide to monitor the stroke volume and cardiac output monitors. There are more advanced devices where you have oximetric catheters where at the tip they have a fibro optic uh, devices which allows to continuous monitoring of the mixed venous oxygen saturation and additional parameters to measure the right ventricular ejection fraction uh, where a th thermistor is in, uh, in, in, uh, incorporated to beat-to-beat -beat, uh, measurement of the temperature change. So these are all the various different types of pulmonary artery catheters available. So uh, uh, just to refresh the knowledge about the basics of pulmonary artery catheters is 110 centimeter long. The catheter markings occurs every 10 centimeters. There are markings made at every 10 centimeter points so that the length of the catheter is identified easily. So that is a distal port which opens to a lumen running the length of the catheter terminating at the stip. Okay. So the port opens or measures the pulmonary artery pressures or pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. And this port is utilized to sample mixed venous blood. The balloon inflation port opens to a lumen that terminates with a balloon located at the tip of the catheter. The balloon is inflated with 1 to 1.5 ml of air to facilitate passage through the heart and to wedge the catheter to obtain the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. And there are two ports. A proximal port opens at 30 centimeter from the distal tip 
and it is used to measure the right atrial pressures and infusion of fluids. There are another proximal port which is located 26 cm from the distal tip which is also used for infusion of fluids and monitoring. A protective sheath is extended along the external length of the catheter attached to the interducer. So where do we normally position these catheters? So pulmonary artery catheter has to be positioned in the west zone 3 where we need to have a constant blood flow which happens in zone 3 where the pulmonary arterial pressure is greater than the capillary pressure, which is greater than the alveolar pressure. So how do we identify that the pulmonary artery, artery catheter is ideally positioned is that while measuring the pulmonary artery diastolic pressures are always higher than the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure and the catheter tip should be uh, below the level of the left atrium on a lateral chest x-ray and the visible A and V waves are seen uh, as a cardiac ripple when you have a uh, which pressure, which uh, monitoring waveforms and uh, changes in the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure is less than half the changes in the PEEP during a PEEP trial. So these parameters tells us that the pulmonary artery catheter is ideally positioned. So this is a normal uh, uh, pressure tracing as we move from the right atrium to the uh, pulmonary artery which pressures and these are all the normal lengths uh, at which the uh, each uh, uh, chambers of the heart is achieved using the pulmonary artery catheters. So right atrium usually at 10 to 15 centimeters, right ventricle at 20 to 25 centimeters of the catheter. Pulmonary artery is usually 35 to 50 centimeters. So the normal right atrial pressures would be 0 to 6, where you see as a central venous waveforms. And once the uh, right atrium is, uh, right ventricle is reached, there is a pressure shoot, a systolic pressure shoot to up to 15 to 25 millimeters of mercury and reaches a baseline from the, uh, to the right atrial pressure. And once we move from the pulmonary artery, uh, right ventricle into the pulmonary artery, there is a diastolic uh, upshoot. That is, uh, the systolic pressures remains the same between, uh, similar to the right ventricle, 15 to 25 millimeters of mercury, but the diastolic pressure increases to 6 to 12 millimeters of mercury when the catheter tip is in the pulmonary artery. Once the catheter is wedged appropriately, it measures a uh, pressure range between 16 to 12, and you would see this cardiac ripple kind of a picture that has A and C wave pattern. So uh, there are normal variables which are measured due using a pulmonary artery uh, catheters and there are derived variables uh, measured uh, using formulas from the basic variables derived from the pulmonary artery catheters. So uh, cardiac output can be derived using a pulmonary artery catheters and hence cardiac index can be calculated. Central venous pressure is documented uh, using the right atrial port and the pulmonary artery wedge pressure is documented when the pulmonary catheters are wedged and uh, pulmonary arterial pressures are uh, monitored and also the mixed venous oxygen saturation and uh, central venous oxygen saturation as well can be uh, obtained using the pulmonary artery catheters. From these measured variables, the derived variables like stroke volume, stroke volume index, uh, systemic vascular resistance, and pulmonary vascular resistance are calculated using the formula. So why do we uh, worry about uh, the hemodynamic monitoring? So coming into, uh, so we have brushed our knowledge about uh, arterial pressures. We have brushed our knowledge about the central venous pressure monitoring and the pulmonary artery catheters. So with these three parameters, what are all the hemodynamic parameters which we can monitor using these invasive monitors? We need to understand why do we chase these values? So preload, afterload, and the cardiac output are the parameters which can be uh, monitored using these devices. Preload is defined as a myocardial distension before a systole, and uh, which with respect to frank starling relationship, the myocardial uh, contraction force depends upon the muscle fiber stretch, which is exactly the preload. And afterload is the resistance against which the ventricles must push the blood. And the European guidelines suggest that apart from the clinical assessment, all these parameters should be guided with the physical examination, with the basic uh, monitoring devices, and along with the advanced hemodynamic monitoring devices. So uh, why is that pulmonary capillary wedge pressure helps to guide the preload? How is that wedge pressure reflects the uh, preload of the uh, left ventricle? So left ventricular preload is an important determinant of cardiac output. So LV preload can be defined as the left ventricular end diastolic volume. 
which is an, uh, an important determinant of left ventricular end diastolic volume is the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. So LV end diastolic pressure is a close reflection of the left atrial end uh, diastolic pressure as the ventricles fill from the atria and we assume that both the atrial and the ventricular compliance are normal. So in those scenarios, the left atrial end diastolic pressure is similar to the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. This left ventricular end diastolic pressure is the preload with which the heart has to pump the blood, which directly responds to the cardiac output. So left atrial pressure is the pressure measured when the pulmonary um, uh, arterial catheters are wedged. So it reflects the uh, left atrial uh, pressures. So uh, this, uh, this explains, this diagram explains the uh, wedging of the catheter. So once the catheter is wedged, there is no flow happening. So the pressure measured at this point distal to the wedging will reflect the left atrial pressure, assuming that the left atrium So pulmonary arterial wedge pressure, normal instance, will reflect the left ventricular and diastolic pressure. But there are certain scenarios where the pulmonary arterial wedge pressure is not the direct reflection of the left ventricular and diastolic pressure. So for example, when there is pulmonary venous resistance, high pulmonary venous resistance, the distal pressure is... Um, the measured pressure is higher actually. Though. So pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be higher than the left ventricular and diastolic pressures. And also when the catheter is not wedged in the appropriate position and when there is still flow in the wedge uh, that is not uh, properly wedged, still flow in the catheter distal to the wedging. And also certain scenarios where the pulmonary arterial wedge pressures are lower than the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. So for example, in aortic regurgitation and mitral regurgitations where the pressures on the left side of the heart are higher compared to the capillary wedge pressures. And also when the left ventricle is non-compliant and there is also patients on positive pressure ventilation where there is excessive intrathoracic positive pressures. And left ventricular end diastolic pressure may not predict the left ventricular end diastolic volume. So we assume that when measuring a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, that left ventricular end, uh, left ventricular end diastolic pressure is a direct uh, correlation of the left ventricular uh, end diastolic volume. So which is the cardiac output volume. So, so in certain scenarios, that might not be the true case where the LV is poorly complained, for example, post myocardial infarction or a left ventricular hypertrophy where the left ventricular end diastolic pressures are higher. And also, for example, in patients with cardiac tamponade. So, and also where a RV is over distended and that compresses the LV and ca causing increase in the left ventricular end diastolic pressure, which might not relatively reflect the left ventricular end diastolic volume and hence our cardiac output. So uh, with so much of uh, complex scenarios uh, and so much of uh, uh, absurd uh, uh, variations and uh, with a lot of uh, uh, technical difficulties, why do we still uh, rely on pulmonary artery catheters? There are certain indications where the pulmonary artery catheters will uh, give us additional information about the patient's hemodynamic status. For example, when the cardiac output measurement, especially in the patients with arrhythmias, or aortic balloon pump, uh, where other uh, invasive hemodynamic monitoring devices cannot be used, where the pulmonary artery catheters can give us an insight about the hemodynamic status of the patients. And unequal right and left ventricular failure, complex hemodynamic instabilities where the patient presents with combination of shock features like obstructive, obstructive cardiogenic or a hypovolemic shock. It's a combination of uh, scenarios where uh, the pulmonary artery catheters still have a role and to differentiate between cardiogenic pulmonary edema from a non-cardiogenic cause. 
and also certain indications like to titrate the pulmonary antihypertensives in ARDS where we use nitric oxide or prostacycline for pulmonary vasodilatation and also in scenarios where there is reversible systolic heart failure like myocarditis and peripartum cardiomyopathy where these pulmonary artery catheters aid us in managing the hemodynamics of the patient and also in differential diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension and also transplant worker for cardiac and pulmonary uh, transplant patients. So, what are the contraindications for pulmonary artery catheters? Uh, as uh, as uh, uh, obvious that uh, the right side of the heart, uh, where there is a tricuspid or pulmonary uh, prosthesis or vegetations and uh, endocarditis in general, and there is a mass in the right side of the heart, and then there is uh, delicate structures in the heart. For example, if the patient is already having a transvenous pacing, and patients with severe tricuspid or pulmonary stenosis, and also extremely thinned atrium or ventricle. So these are all the contraindications wherein we are unable to use a pulmonary artery catheters. So coming to certain insights about, uh, about studies uh, based on the PACs. Uh, so initially, the first study was done in 1973, which was published by Crexel, where uh, they, uh, they infused volumes to patients with low filling pressures and administered diuretics for those patients who were uh, pulmonary artery wedge pressures were on the higher sides. So they were able to reproduce the Frank Starling's curve and act upon these repeated real-time uh, estimates where the pulmonary artery catheters came into clinical practice where the anesthetists, critical care physicians were using more and more of PACs. And uh, the, the publication that first weekend the PAC was in 1996 where a JAMA study showed that 5,735 critically ill patients were associated with, uh, they reported the increased mortality and increased length of stay and increased cost with respect to PACs. And the, finally, uh, the myth was broken with a Pac-Man trial, that is pulmonary artery catheters in patient management trial, which conducted between 2001 and 2004, provides the strongest evidence states that the PACs neither benefit nor harm the patients broadly defined in ICU populations. So pulmonary artery catheter measurements are subject to significant operator errors and physiological variations that complicate interpretation and response. So what are the recommendations? As I said earlier, the indications of PACs based on the guidelines, patients with high risk for complex cardiac interventions, in severe low cardiac output syndromes and patients with high pulmonary hypertension where you have to have the diagnosis and differentiation between the severe right and left ventricular dysfunctions. And there is no role for PACs in a low perioperative risk patients at present. So these are all the uh, overviews about uh, the invasive monitors. So now coming to the most important uh, parameter which we assess during the hemodynamic instability is the cardiac output. So hemodynamic status monitors measures the ability of an individual to deliver ability of the organism to deliver oxygen to the tissues. So tissue oxygenation is consequently determined by oxygen delivery, which is in turn determined by the product of arterial blood oxygen content and the cardiac output. So cardiac output can consequently be considered as a good index of tissue oxygenation given a sufficient blood oxygen content. So cardiac output is determined by the preload, afterload, contractility, and heart rate. So there are monitors which use uh, which are used in assessing the cardiac output. So these are all the various monitors and methods which are used to measure the cardiac output in different scenarios to give the status of the hemodynamics of the patient. So as I was talking about earlier, pulmonary artery catheters are used to measure the cardiac output using what is called as pulmonary thermodilution technique. This pulmonary artery catheter can either be used as a single step catheters or to monitor continuously the cardiac output using a thermal filaments. And there are other monitors like PICO and volume view, which utilizes transpulmonary thermodilution technique. So they can either uh, use a single measurement or it, it uses the continuous monitoring devices where it has to be calibrated. For this PICO or volume view, one need to have a central axis and also the arterial axis either in the femoral, brachial and arterial axillary lines. This transpulmonary thermodilution technique, which is uh, measured using a PICO or volume view devices also measures what we call it as extravascular lung water, which is a very important monitor in assessing the risk of patient developing a pulmonary edema. Uh, 
the other method of assessing cardiac output will be a transpulmonary indicator dilution technique where we uh, use lithium as an indicator where the need for central axis or a peripheral uh, vein can be used and the monitor uh, is attached to the arterial line and the changes in the uh, indicator concentration derives the cardiac output. And there is other, para <coughs> other monitors where we assess the uh, cardiac output through arterial pressure waveforms. So this PITCO, LITCO device, uh, flow track, and Vigilio uses this uh, algorithms. There, there are different waveform algorithms which are computed and analyzes the area under the uh, arterial line curve and just gives the stroke volume and uh, hence the cardiac output of the patient. There are other uh, uh, monitors as well. I'll just uh, brief about it. Esophageal Doppler and the partial carbon uh, dioxide rebreathing circuits. And I think uh, the non-invasive hemodynamic monitoring will be more emphasis on the bioimpedance, bioreactants, etc. And also the gold standard, the transthoracic and transesophageal echoes are monitors which provides valuable information about the cardiac output and hence the hemodynamic status of the patient. So let's uh, uh, just brush your knowledge about uh, the basics of these uh, few parameters which uh, you are used in the hemodynamic monitoring devices. Um, coming to the indicator dilution or thermodilution. So whatever uh, uh, the uh, methodology, it, it, they can either use a dye or they can use a saline or they can use a cold saline which assesses the temperature change or a dye which uses the uh, concentration change of the indicator. So the principle will be to assess the cardiac output is based on that. The rate of blood flow, hence the cardiac output, can be determined from the rate of change in the concentration of a substance after a known amount of it has been added to the bloodstream. So Stewart Hamilton arrived at the equation where flow is directly proportional to the dose of the indicator and inversely proportional to the concentration time curve. So either an indicator or a uh, temperature change is analyzed and then a curve is formed and area under the curve is analyzed using the formula and then the cardiac output is documented or measured with the following formula is indicator dose divided by the area under the concentration time curve. So this is basically the indicator dilution technique. And Stewart Hamilton modified this indicator dilution technique uh, with a formula which includes the uh, computerized constant or injected temperature change to assess the cardiac output with respect to the thermodilution technique. So moreover, it's almost a similar formula which is slightly modified uh, in thermodilution management. So when an indicator dye is introduced uh, into the system, a known volume of indicator is added to the bloodstream. And then at the distal end, the concentration of the indicator is plotted against a time and the area under the concentration curve uh, and with the known concentration, one can derive the cardiac output. So what is the advantage of this over the standard fixed method of uh, measuring the cardiac output is that there is no need to access the mixed venous blood or arterial blood. It is convenient with the electronic cal uh, calculations and cardiac output measures can be automated and it can be made continuous and it, would, uh, it uh, correlates well with the gold standard measurements of cardiac output. So... Uh, <clears throat> So uh, this, all these uh, uh, thermodilution techniques also provides us with various other parameters uh, to assess the invasive, uh, assess the hemodynamic status of the patient. So temperature falls between the injection site and the measured site proportional to the cardiac output. These systems also permit indirect calculations of what is called as the extravascular lung water index as a measure of pulmonary edema, which is helpful in guiding the fluid administration. And there is also a static parameter, what is called as a global end diastolic volume, which assesses the preload, which is more reliable compared to the central venous pressures or the pulmonary arterial diastolic pressures. But then patients with uh, severe right side of valvular regurgitation, intracardiac strains, concomitant infusions may impact these kind of cardiac output measurements. So uh, just an overview about uh, what we uh, phrase it as in thermodilution uh, technique, 
uh, or indicator dilution technique. Uh, indicator or a cold saline is injected into a uh, central venous axis and the measured at the distal end, either at the proximal arterial uh, uh, axis or a radial axis. So uh, the thermal volumes are calculated using various formulas. So these are all the different thermal volumes. So this is the right, the temperature distributes into different chambers of the heart, which provides different information about the uh, thermal volumes into the, uh, in the intrathoracic uh, system. So uh, with the area under the pressure curve, we monitor the um, uh, cardiac output. So with that, along with the mean, uh, mean time, mean transit time and other parameters, one can derive the intrathoracic thermal volumes. So the whole volume in the intrathoracic space includes called as intrathoracic thermal volume. And also one can derive the pulmonary thermal volume. So once when you exclude uh, the intrathoracic ther pulmonary thermal volume from the intrathoracic thermal volume, one can get what is called as the end diastolic volume. So global end diastolic volume is the volume of the blood remaining in the uh, heart at the end of the diastole, which predicts the preload. So once uh, from there, one can calculate the intrathoracic blood volume. So once the intrathoracic blood volume is identified, extravascular lung volume can be calculated and derived from the above parameters. This extravascular lung volume is a volume present in the lung, uh, in the pulmonary interstitium or alveoli, which predicts the uh, whether the individual will be more prone for pulmonary edema. So what are the limitations of these uh, kind of thermodilution techniques are? Even use a dye, uh, the use of dye limits the frequency and repeatability of the measurements. And manual integration of area under the curve is laborious. And automated calculations of cardiac output involves correction factors and coefficients, which then reduces its accuracy. And this method relies upon uniform mixing of the blood and the unidirectional flow. So when these things are altered, the cardiac output is not directly proportional. Under laboratory conditions, uh, it uh, almost similar to the margin of 25% with a direct uh, method, with a fixed method of uh, measuring the cardiac output. So uh, to put it in, uh, to summarize it, so there are two uh, major forms of assessing the cardiac output using an invasive monitor. One is transpulmonary thermodilution and another one is a pulse counter analysis. So uh, earlier I was talking about the transpulmonary thermodilution. So why is it transpulmonary? Is it that uh, the dye or uh, cold saline is injected into a proximal vein and then the change in the concentration is measured at the distal arteries. Uh, in a pit core system, it is measured using a femoral artery, and in a lithium or dye dilution, it is measured using a peripheral arteries as well. So that is a transpulmonary thermodilution. The difference in the concentration is plotted against the curve, area under the curve, which helps us to derive the cardiac output and the global end diastolic volume, intrathoracic blood volume, extravascular lung volume and other parameters like pulmonary vascular permeability index. So with all these parameters, one can assess whether we need to push in more fluids or give them a diuretic or add a more inotropes or vasopressors. In case of pulse counter analysis, the arterial waveform is analyzed and the area under the systolic portion of the arterial curve is plotted. And then there are different uh, techniques used, analytics used to measure and derive the cardiac output. So they derive is what is called as pulse counter cardiac output. So they also uh, uh, gives us a measure of the arterial blood pressure, heart rate, stroke volume, and these pulse counter analysis helps us to assess what we earlier talked about, the stroke volume variation and the pulse pressure variation, and also they measure the systemic vascular resistance. So uh, these are the different uh, techniques which are used in different uh, monitors to assess the arterial waveforms. In uh, PICO technique, as I was mentioning, they analyze the area under the curve. And in case of litco-lithium curve, their pulse-prova analysis is the methodology used to analyze uh, the 
uh, arterial waveform and in flow track and vigilio the dynamic tone with multiple uh, measurements are done analyzing the multiple waveforms to derive and mention the stroke volume or indirectly and directly the cardiac output so to summarize the pulmonary artery catheters use what is called as indicator dilution technique and with that one can measure the uh, cardiac output either uh, continuously or uh, in a single state depending upon what type of pulmonary artery catheter we are using and pulse counter analysis is what i was talking about earlier analyzes the arterial waveforms which are minimally invasive there are both calibrated and uncalibrated techniques and uh, these can be used for continuous uh, monitoring of the stroke volume and also they also give us about the stroke volume variation which predicts the responsiveness of fluid status so coming to another important parameter which we analyze using a pulse uh, uh, pulmonary arterial catheter and also the uh, central venous catheters either the mixed venous oxygen saturation or central venous oxygen saturation this central uh, mixed venous oxygen saturation is obtained from the uh, venous uh, scaval blood sampling it is less invasive and fairly correlates with the um, central venous uh, sorry mixed venous oxygen saturation so oxygen extraction is about 25% okay uh, of the total amount of blood delivered to the peripheral tissues when it is completely oxygenated by the arterial blood this results in 75% oxygen saturation in the central venous hemoglobin so in the central venous oxygen saturation shows earlier patient hemodynamic imbalance prior to other hemodynamic or lab value changes and it considered a valid endpoint for shock resuscitation so oxygen saturation less than 60 to 65% has been shown to predict adverse outcomes and mixed uh, central venous oxygen saturations uh, show early patient hemodynamic imbalance and uh, oxygen saturation oh, sorry i have repeated the same so it's alone uh, determines a hemodynamic status so when a uh, central venous oxygen saturation is high it can either be in decrease in the delivery or it can either be due to increase in oxygen consumption so decrease in delivery secondary to anemia or bleeding hypovolemia heart failure or increase in oxygen consumption by the sympathetic overactivity secondary to pain agitation shivering and fever so all these scenarios will cause a decrease in the Uh, central venous oxygen saturation certain situations where the central venous oxygen saturations are higher for example when there is uh, uh, septic shock where the uh, microcirculatory dysfunction happens and the oxygen consumption is reduced and in uh, surgical patients where hypothermia sedation analgesia where the metabolism reduces the consumption is reduced whereas increase in delivery of uh, uh, oxygen happens during transfusions and excessive fluid challenges uh, and inotropic use so all these scenarios will have a higher mixed venous sorry central venous oxygen saturation so now coming to, so we have discussed about uh, how do we interact uh, different uh, uh, invasive hemodynamic monitors so now we need to understand that uh, what are the complications related to uh, these invasive hemodynamic monitors so in patients with arterial blood pressure monitoring one need to be uh, very sure about zeroing zero reference point is very very important with respect to measurements of arterial blood pressure in different scenarios when you are measuring a cerebral uh, arterial perfusion pressure zero point is different. Different. and when we are measuring an arterial blood pressure uh, to assess the cardiac output the zeroing is different and the damping coefficient is very very important when the system is either over damped or under damped that might not give a adequate uh, or appropriate blood pressure tracing and with respect to cvp as i was telling you earlier uh, decreased right ventricular compliance uh, tricuspid valvular diseases increases the central venous pressures and uh, in uh, positive pressure ventilation also central venous pressures are overestimated and in patients with intra abdominal pressure high for example in laparoscopic uh, uh, surgeries the uh, central venous pressures may be artificially elevated Uh, we were more talking about uh, this pulse pressure variations and stroke volume variations so as i was telling you uh, these are derived from arterial waveform analysis uh, using various uh, uh, interpretations and various technologies so there are certain checklist validation criteria for which Uh, these stroke volume variations or pulse pressure variations are ideal for patients who have these following checklist so the patient have 
has to be on controlled mechanical ventilation without any spontaneous effort. And the ventilation should be a tidal volume of 7 to 8 ml per kg ideal body weight. There should not be any closed chest uh, conditions uh, in the sense open chest injury should not be present. And the patient should not have any forms of arrhythmias and the compliance of the lung should be normal so that they transmit and we can able to understand the uh, heart-lung interactions during the positive pressure ventilation and uh, these patients are unaffected by the valvular heart diseases that uh, the, uh, should be excluded and we assume that the right and the left ventricular uh, functions are synchronized and coordinated and um, the normal abdominal pressure as well. And uh, so these are all the validity criteria checklist uh, where the pulse pressure variation or the stroke volume variation reliably predicts the cardiac output. So in certain situations when there is extreme tachycardias or extreme bradycardias and high frequency ventilation, the uh, pulse pressure variations may be falsely negative. And in case of regular heartbeats like atrial fibrillation, the pulse pressure variation might be falsely positive. And when patients are ventilated with low tidal volumes in ARDS kind of a picture, that might also give us a falsely negative values. And uh, in case, uh, for example, in laparoscopic uh, surgeries, that might increase the intrathoracic pressure and that might false give false positive values during assessing the pulse pressure variation. And uh, uh, these, uh, when there is open chest injuries and when the patient is spontaneously breathing, they might not relatively predict the pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation might not predict the cardiac output. So, uh, so to summarize uh, uh, the parameters used to assess the invasive hemodynamic monitoring, there are static parameters and there are dynamic parameters. Static parameters, as we are aware, uh, are the central venous pressures and pulmonary artery occlusion pressures. And uh, these static parameters reliably reflects the preload only when the patient is in the steep form of the frank styling curve. Once the patient is in the uh, horizontal or uh, uh, in this uh, slope of the uh, curve, then they might not relatively reflect the uh, preload of the uh, heart, this static parameters. So then comes your dynamic parameters. So the static parameter also has this global end diastolic volume and left ventricular end diastolic volume. So these are all the measures used to assess the static uh, pressures. Now, coming to dynamic uh, hemodynamic monitors are the pulse pressure variation and the systolic pressure variation and stroke volume variation. These three variations rely on the heart-lung interaction of the venti positively pressure ventilated patients and assess the preload predictability. And there are certain checklist criteria where these parameters are reliably uh, predicts the preload of the patient and also the fluid responsiveness of the patient. So we need to understand that from which patient perspective and which ideal patients where these monitors can be utilized. So, uh, and coming to other uh, parameters, which I was talking to you earlier is the uh, PICCO and the LITCO monitors. So in uh, uh, earlier, the pulmonary artery catheters where I was telling that it, you can utilize as continuous cardiac output monitors or a single stage cardiac output measurements can be monitored using a P, uh, pulmonary artery catheters and lithium dilution technique uh, where you insert an arterial line and the dye is inserted through the uh, central or a peripheral axis and the uh, change in the uh, dye concentration reflects your cardiac output. So this measure, these uh, PITCO and LITCO are all minimal invasive monitors where they need to be calibrated. And uh, flow track where it just assesses the pulse pressure contour and it doesn't need to be calibrated. So uh, to summarize, uh, how uh, or what type of monitors uh, we can utilize in patients with 
acute circulatory failure. So when we have a low blood pressure or low cardiac output or signs of tissue hypoperfusion, then you need to assess whether you need to give fluids or restrict fluids. So when there is fluid loss or in patient with septic vasodilated shock, uh, we need be it is obvious then we need to go for volume expansion and when we are uh, unable to judge whether there is fluid loss or a volume loss or there is a shocked state but there is a systemic vasodilatation then we need to understand whether the we need to assess the clinical picture of the patient whether the patient is spontaneously breathing is the patient is having any cardiac arrhythmias or are we using any low tidal volume ventilation if no, then we can assess the pulse pressure or stroke volume variation using a arterial uh, monitors like flow track and uh, respiratory variations of IVCs and SVCs can be assured you, uh, assessed using an echo monitors and all other parameters like passive leg rise and expiratory occlusion tests and mini fluid challenges, all those things can be utilized in those scenarios. When uh, patient is spontaneously breathing and the patient has a cardiac arrhythmia or the patient has uh, been ventilated with low tidal volumes, which normally happens in most of the critically ill patients. Then we have few other uh, parameters to go about is a passive leg right test and end expiratory occlusion test and mini fluid challenges. So these are all the uh, monitors uh, advised as advised in the uh, uh, surgical patients. So usually the advanced monitoring is utilized in medium to high risk patients, all the monitors which was discussed earlier. So as the risk progresses, the monitoring involved also uh, becomes more and more invasive. So there are a few questions which are answered in uh, 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 perioperative hemodynamic optimization and guidelines implementation with the expert panel. There are a few questions which was which we normally uh, ask and uh, I could find this paper uh, useful so that I thought I will just, uh, just put on these questions and the answer answers by the expert opinion as well. So which blood pressure goal should be targeted during anesthesia and perioperative period? The expert opinion was we proposed to prefer continuous invasive arterial pressure monitoring in moderate to high risk surgical patients, ideally using an algorithm based approach because uh, as I said earlier, the algorithm which is used to assess the blood pressure monitoring, preventing and managing hypotension. So what is a MAP target? The MAP target would be about 65 millimeters of mercury or patients with hypertension, then you need to understand that it should be between 10 to 20% of the preoperative reference testing values. So our dynamic indices, like the pulse pressure variations and stroke volume variations and many words, predict and manage volume expansions. So uh, as we discussed earlier about the validity criteria checklist should be performed before using the pulse pressure variation to estimate fluid responsiveness and also to give small fluid boluses to assess the pulse pressure change or responders. So responders are those who have a pulse pressure variation of more than 13 and uh, uh, patients are unlikely to respond to flu fluid who have a pulse pressure variations of less than 9%. And um, Alternative assessment of pulse pressure uh, volume change is the end expiratory uh, occlusion maneuvers or a mini fluid challenge. So when we do an end expiratory occlusion maneuvers or a mini fluid challenge, a 3.5% absolute increase in the pulse pressure variation during the transit raise in the tidal volume uh, is a good predictor of fluid drive responsiveness and an absolute decrease in the pulse pressure variation more than 2% during a mini fluid challenge is a predictor of fluid responsiveness. So when should we measure stroke volume and cardiac output? We propose to use mini or non-invasive continuous methods to monitor cardiac output or stroke volume rather than invasive reference technique implemented in the perioperative global didactic therapy in moderate to high-risk patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery. And as the clinical scenario becomes more and more complex and when the patient's need for invasive monitoring increases, then we implement more and more invasive monitoring. So we also need to talk about the economic impact or hemodynamic monitoring for the goal directed therapy. So that has to be definitely looked upon about the economic impact of the in, uh, advanced hemodynamic monitoring used. <laughs> 
and a few words about uh, hemodynamic monitoring in cardiac surgeries because uh, cardiac surgery patients undergo rapid changes in cardiac performance and vascular tone that may diminish the accuracy of other monitors and uh, requires the clinician to rapidly differentiate between early signs of shock like bleeding, graft occlusions, and uh, tamponade. So these uh, areas are where PACs uh, play a major role where they uh, are uh, technical and selection criteria can be overcome because they use very frequent and they're more uh, uh, familiar with these uh, pulmonary arctic catheter techniques. So coming into the evidence, pulse count your analysis uh, in post-operative CABG patients have a good correlation with the gold standard pulmonary artery dilu uh, thermodilution techniques. And also like uh, measurements like intrathoracic blood volumes uh, and uh, uh, pulmonary artery occlusion pressures uh, using a PAC catheter is recommended in major cardiac surgeries. And uh, CVP alone is not a good predictor of volume status and mixed venous oxygen saturation uh, could actually contribute along with other parameters to assess the hemodynamic changes. So algorithm in uh, uh, patients, indications for advanced hemodynamic monitoring uh, in a cardiac surgical patients is when the patient has you know, hemodynamic instability and you have an obvious uh, STT changes, then if the patient is intubated, you go for a transesophageal echo. And if the patient is not intubated, transthoracic echo, along with that, a quality DCG and a mixed venous oxygen saturation will help us to assess the further hemodynamic assessment. When there is a low cardiac output uh, status and the patient undergoes a high-risk cardiac surgery, then along with the transesophageal echo or transthoracic echo, and along with the mixed venous oxygen saturation, we need to assess, sorry, central venous oxygen saturation. We can implement pulse counter analysis uh, to assess the response. And if they further go for right heart failure or a low cardiac output, say it becomes more and more complex, then pulmonary artery catheter has its role here in these kind of patients. And uh, valvular defects, coronary artery disease, a pulmonary heart, with complex patients, uh, pulmonary artery catheters and play a major role in assessing the hemodynamic monitoring. So how, uh, how do we either, you can be a reactive uh, person or a proactive uh, person to assess and to monitor the hemodynamic changes in the perioperative period and in the critically ill patients and also extend into the post-operative monitoring of patients who have hemodynamic instability. A reactive person would be to correct the uh, changes which is happening, like to correct the hypotension, to correct the uh, uh, tachycardias and give fluids when you suspect uh, hypovolemia secondary to pulse pressure changes and, uh, and promptly react or identify the cardiac output. For us, proactive uh, uh, management would be maintain an ad adequate arterial blood pressure with a map of more than or, uh, 65 to maximize the stroke volume and to uh, maintain the pulse pressure variation between the 12 to 14 percent range and using invasive hemodynamic monitoring to maintain the cardiac index of around 4.5 liters per minute per meter square and maintain a central venous saturations of more than 65. This has to be implemented during the perioperative period, postoperative period, and as well as in all critically ill patients. Thank you. Rajesh, thank you, Arti. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your elaborate uh, lecture. Uh, we have some questions, Arti. Yes, sir. Uh, so, what is the uh, role of uh, PAC over transesophageal echo? Is it uh, reliable for cardiac output uh, monitoring? Which one is reliable? Whether uh, pulmonary artery catheter or cardiac output using uh, transesophageal echo? Sir, it is not the technique which we uh, actually compare the reliability. It is more depending upon the clinical scenario of the patients. When you have a patient who is intubated and who have a complications, who know uh, where we have to monitor the hemodynamic status, I would first start off with the, when there is an available transesophageal echo, then I would first start off with the transesophageal echo. That will be less invasive compared to the pulmonary artery catheters. Pulmonary artery catheters are gold standard, but then it has more of absorbed variation and a lot of technical difficulties to assess the uh, uh, hemodynamic uh, response. Whereas transesophageal echo would be a bedside assessment, which would give a more reliable information. So it is always more of a patient-centered rather than the monitored-centered. Um, arterial blood pressure versus uh, non-invasive blood pressure in ICU, which one will give you uh, accurate blood pressure monitoring? If you go for invasive lines, 
how long you have to keep the lines and uh, whether it is ultrasound guided arterial line placement or uh, Okay, so uh, uh, coming to critically ill patients, uh, comparing non-invasive blood pressures and invasive blood pressures, non-invasive blood pressures uh, always uh, doesn't really work well when extremes of blood pressure changes. In a low blood pressure situation, it overestimates the blood pressure. In a high uh, hypertensive patient, it underestimates the blood pressure. So invasive arterial monitoring is indicated in extremes of blood pressures, blood pressure changes, and ultrasound is mandated nowadays to utilize and to avoid complications when you go for a insertion of an arterial axis. And how long, there is no specific guidelines of how long we need to leave the catheter in. It is how we maintain the catheter axis and daily monitoring and the daily inspection of the insertion site is mandatory. Once you suspect an infection, ongoing infection or signs, earlier signs of uh, thrombophlebitis or uh, earlier signs of uh, arterial uh, uh, inflammation, then that is when we have to remove the arterial axis immediately. Uh, uh, tell about mini fluid challenge. You, you mentioned again and again about mini fluid challenge. What is that? So there are a lot of uh, uh, studies and guidelines uh, which ranges uh, the uh, normally uh, fluid challenges we tend to give between 250 to 500 ml of volumes. So there are certain guidelines now evolving about mini fluid challenges less than 200 ml. For example, 100 ml to 150 ml where in patients where we expect them to develop pulmonary edema, for example, in patients who have vascular leak syndrome, in patients with ARDS, where risk of volume overload is high, that's when they advise a mini fluid challenge of 100 to 150 ml of fluid boluses given over 5 to 10 minutes period. And then the pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variation is assessed at the end of the uh, infusion to avoid volume overload. Thank you, thank you. Thanks a lot, Arti. Thanks for your uh, nice explanation and the lecture. Thank you. We'll move ahead with the next uh, lecture. Thank you. thank you, sir. Thank so you. the next uh, lecture is on uh, the next lecture is on uh, hemodynamic uh, monitoring, which is non-invasive uh, methodology. And the uh, speaker will be Dr. Pratima, uh, who is an ICU coordinator and senior consultant in critical care medicine from Apollo Specialty Hospital. OMR uh, Chennai. Looking at her uh, profile at the degree what she had got, itself speaks a lot that she, how much she is passionate towards critical care medicine. Uh, after clearing DNB, she had got uh, both IDCCM and IFCCM, which are uh, from uh, ISCCM degrees. And she had also cleared her European uh, diplomat in Indian Care AD. And she's a teacher for various critical care uh, courses and uh, certified simulation trainer. And uh, she's also ATLS provider and instructor for ACLS and uh, BLS. A lot of uh, paper presentations and a lot, uh, 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 lot of CMEs and conferences attended as faculties. And she had conducted a workshop in hemodynamic monitoring long back in 2016 in ISSM. And she's the right person to talk about uh, hemodynamic monitoring, non-invasive methodology. Over to you, Dr. Pratima. So good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you uh, for having me here. It's a Sunday. It is really surprising that so many people have joined. So um, without much delay, I would like to go into the presentation. Uh, so am I audible, sir? Uh, is the slides moving? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So... Uh, Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, yes, I'm passionate towards critical care and uh, I'm basically an anesthetist. So both together. So uh, today, uh, I think uh, Dr. Arti had given a very uh, comprehensive lecture about hemodynamic monitoring itself. And uh, most of uh, my slides or uh, talk will be a uh, overlap. Anyway, I'll uh, keep it uh, less invasive as possible. Okay. So, uh, what is hemodynamic monitoring? Is it really necessary? What are we monitoring? So um, we need to look at the patient. Hemo is blood, dynamic is movement. So we need to know how the blood is getting moved into the patient, basically the circulation. And what is our role? We are there to um, uh, give oxygen to the patient and make sure oxygen is all perfused. It is reaching the target cells and it is getting used properly. So this is the basic thing what we uh, do if we talk in English about uh, hemodynamic monitoring. So 
there are very various variables we really don't know we are giving oxygen through the lungs uh, and the tissues are elsewhere uh, it is the uh, uh, duty of the heart to pump properly there is a pump uh, or a motor which is the heart uh, there are many tubes it is basic plumbing so uh, the arteries or the tubes and uh, there is a tank uh, so uh, the venous uh, uh, ves uh, venous uh, capacitance or the uh, all the veins we call it a tank because they are reservoirs so is the pump working well is the uh, tubes uh, working well is the um, uh, tank uh, getting filled or is it half full so this is what uh, the whole hemodynamic monitoring is about so if you look at just a glance it is going to be a static we don't know whether uh, uh, it is moving it is in the circulation properly so uh, as dr arthi had comprehensively talked about all the methods of uh, hemodynamic monitoring so basically we uh, use all these monitors only to see whether uh, the blood is getting appropriately perfused and is the tissues getting proper oxygen and vice versa if the tissues are uh, a uh, clearing of uh, the toxic materials is it coming back to the heart going to the lungs and is the get blood getting purified so this is what we need to know in a patient so a patient comes to icu uh, when the patient is sick uh, in uh, anesthesia it need not be but we need to always have a look at the heart and the working of the heart so oxygen delivery basically as i told you so uh, is the delivery very good is the tissue oxygenation uh, very efficient so what we look uh, is look into is uh, into three different uh, parts so one is the hemoglobin uh, which carries oxygen one is the cardiac output which keeps the circulation going on and other is the arterial oxygen saturation how much is the uh, oxygen climbing into the uh, blood climbing into the rbcs and uh, sitting there uh, for the voyage so all these three components uh, are very very important and uh, if we break them into small parts okay we know the hemoglobin we can just measure it um, once uh, every day that is okay or if the patient is bleeding we can uh, uh, measure it every eight hourly uh, we don't need to uh, keep on monitoring or uh, uh, see it every minute yes and uh, we have oxygen saturation uh, monitors like pulse oximeter we just plug uh, we just plug it in and uh, put the clip around the patient's finger so oxygen monitor is continuously oxygen saturation is continuously monitored so what we have to look into uh, continuously is the cardiac output because the heart is receiving blood pumping receiving blood pumping okay is it working very well so break it into even smaller pieces okay cardiac output how do we monitor we need to look into two things stroke volume into heart rate uh, and stroke volume is the uh, is the one shot which the heart gives at one go so how many uh, times does it beat and how many times it is uh, hitting a sixer is what we need to look so stroke volume and heart rate so heart rate we know it will be in the ecg and uh, it is a continuous monitoring yes okay so uh, stroke volume how much the heart is revealed uh, so what is pushed into the heart is the preload so how do we monitor that and uh, is the pump or the motor function good as i said it is called um, in medical language inotropy and how much of the load is pushed against a resistance it is afterload what is the peripheral resistance is the um, artery is very very stiff or is the uh, pressures on the artery side very stiff is there a vasoconstriction is the heart working against a resistance is what we have to see so all these things put together is the hemodynamic monitoring so what we have to look at is mainly the stroke volume and uh, broken into pieces we have to look into the preload inotropy and the afterload so this is basically by clinical basic uh, uh, monitoring advanced monitoring and cardiac output monitoring so clinical we know how we monitor uh, we'll just go through everything so what is the goal of monitor what do you want to see so assure the adequacy of perfusion we are standing the bedside uh, we need monitors to look into the patient so monitors are a communication between the patient and us so uh, we need to look into the adequacy of perfusion is the blood getting perfused well and uh, if there if there is any inadequacy the monitors need to tell us or alert us uh, in a early way so that uh, we can act upon it and uh, uh, catch uh, and prevent further uh, deterioration and if we are uh, alerted uh, we are giving some uh, intervention so um, assess and we intervene okay we are intervening uh, how much should we intervene uh, is there any uh, any measure that is a titration and okay there are different organ uh, system dysfunctions can be differentiate these are the uh, 
things which the monitors need to tell us. This is what we expect from the monitors because we can always uh, stand and look into the patient's number, but we need the monitors to tell us what's happening. Is there any issue? Immediately, uh, uh, the monitor has to alert us. And in case we are intervening, we need to know how much to titrate. Should we increase? Should we decrease? Can we give fluids? Uh, should we give vasopressors? All these things needs to have a numbers so that uh, it is all in a uniform basis. Maybe I uh, feel that I should give fluid to a patient and my colleague feels that it is like patient is uh, fluid filled. So uh, uh, he needs to diuse the patient. So what, what, is, what is the number which we need to do? And it is not one single number. It is a trend. That is what the monitors tell us. So uh, what is the physiological truth? So telling the total secret of hemodynamic monitoring, there is nothing called a normal cardiac output because it is not like one size. We are, uh, the clothes are different. It is not like one size fits all. So uh, the cardiac output is changing and absolute values cannot be uh, taken as uh, um, uh, foolproof. So either uh, it is adequate to meet the metabolic demands or it is inadequate to meet the metabolic demands. So there is a demand from the body. If the patient is sick, if the patient is septic, the demand goes up. Is the cardiac output uh, adequate to match the demand? So supply and demand match is what is very important. There is nothing called a normal cardiac output. We call uh, sometimes a cardiac output normal because we need a baseline. So we need to know whether it is increasing or decreasing. Uh, to uh, find out whether the heart is working very well. So uh, we need to monitor, yes, uh, we have invasive, non-invasive. Invasive had been talked in uh, in length and uh, in very uh, comprehensive way. So uh, non-invasive, what do we do? Basically, we do a non-invasive monitoring when we start with the clinical examination and history. Yes, we start monitoring the patient. We look at the heart rate, pulse, how is the patient uh, um, uh, is the patient warm, cold, uh, cold, clammy? We, we have a lot of fancy terms. So basically, there are three windows uh, to see whether uh, the patient is adequately perfused in a clinical examination. One is the mental status. Uh, is the patient having an altered sensorium? If the patient is in shock uh, or the cardiac output is not good, the patient is going to be drowsy. So that is one window. Second window is, uh, is the urine output good? So uh, urine output falls after some time, after the compensatory mechanisms fall. Uh, then a third thing is, a third window is the skin. So we touch the patient, see whether the patient is cold. Or uh, sometimes uh, in a shock, patient can be warm, uh, but uh, the sensorium can be low. So all the three parameters, all the three windows uh, are uh, what we do uh, look into when we do the clinical examination. So that's that starts the monitoring and it is non-invasive. So uh, when we look at the patient, we need to know, is there a problem? Okay, blood pressure is normal. But if the blood pressure is normal, uh, we cannot rule out the shock because there can be uh, some compensatory mechanism going on. That's why we need to look at the heart rate. If the patient tachycardic sweating, is uh, there can be a vasoconstriction, we don't know. So uh, the body is trying to keep the blood pressure normal. So the blood pressure, if it is normal, cannot rule out the shock. And we need to look at the end organ function. As I told you, there are three windows, uh, including the skin, uh, then the mental state and urinary output. Then there are tests uh, which we do uh, immediately after the clinical examination, which is the blood, uh, blood gas analysis. If you look at the pH and uh, if it is acidotic and if there is hypoxemia and uh, if there is uh, increased lactate, we now know, we know, know that the patient is not getting adequately perfused. So that stands the next level of clinical examination. So this is one case where there is mottling. So you can see that the tissue, uh, the skin is inadequately perfused. So the patient is cold and uh, the skin looks very unhealthy. And we can see uh, this thing as mottling and patient is surely in shock. In this patient, if the blood pressure is normal, uh, we have to look at the heart rate. If he is tachycardic, if he is drowsy, there is less urine output. Then we can see there is edema, but fluid is in the wrong space. So definitely the patient is in shock. So how do we measure the blood pressure? So non-invasive automated devices and invasive measurements. Uh, we know that uh, we went through the uh, arterial line in detail. So non-invasive, I just want to touch upon the simple basics because this is the first thing that we uh, take in our hand before starting the patient on any other uh, monitoring. So we need to know what uh, is the right size of the cuff. So cuff width is very, very important. It should be at least 40% uh, of the circumference of the arm. If it is very wide, 
uh, if the patient is thin and the, it is a big cuff, it is going to underestimate. It will show a less uh, low BP. And if it is too narrow, it is going to show a overestimate. Even if the patient has a normal blood pressure. I'm talking about a patient just for a health check. And uh, even if this is so faulty, imagine about patients who are sick. So width of the bladder should be two-thirds of the upper arm and length should be at least encircling 80% of the arm. So uh, we must make sure it is not crossing the anticubital space and it should be at least 2.5 centimeter above the anticubital space. This is a proper fit of a blood pressure cuff. So non-invasive, uh, it is underread at high pressures, uh, overread at low pressures, less circulate during arrhythmias. So it is a way in which it measures the oscillatory um, uh, oscillatory parameter, the blood pressure has a pulse and the pulse over the brachial artery is uh, just monitored by the sensor in the cuff and the oscillatory method, it shows, uh, it just calculates where the uh, oscillation is higher, lower, it makes a calculation and gives us a reading. But if there is an arrhythmia, imagine the patient is in an atrial fibrillation, the patient will not be having a regular uh, heart rate. So, there can be changes and uh, uh, there can be a faulty blood pressure. So invasive, uh, I know uh, already we had uh, talked a lot about the invasive volatile. So we'll just go through the further things. So exactly what do we want to know? Okay, uh, we have just checked the patient, taken a, a history, clinical examination is done, which we do it simultaneously. We don't do it in sequence because the patient is sick. So we want to know what is the issue? Is there a hypotension? Patient is in a shock. How severe is the shock? So what do we do? Uh, we immediately give fluids. Always A, B, C, D. So we take care of the airway, uh, breathing. Then we just place an IV line uh, for a circulation. And uh, we just assess the patient's uh, disability, uh, GCS, sugar. And we check the temperature, touch the peripheries. So that is uh, what we do in a clinical examination. When we just do it, we this is what goes in our mind. Should we do fluid? Is the patient going to respond to fluid? How do we know? We do not know without any monitoring. And will the patient tolerate fluid? Okay, the patient is breathless or the patient is uh, in shock. Uh, maybe it is a cardiogenic shock. We don't know. If we give fluids, uh, maybe it is a bolus of uh, 250 ml, more than 250 ml. Um, so usually we just rush in 500 ml. Will the patient tolerate fluid? That is what uh, uh, we need to think about before doing anything. So uh, is it going to be fluids or inodrops? I am going to be uh, thinking that I have to be giving fluids for hypotension. My colleague would uh, think uh, that uh, it's better to start uh, noradrenal or a dopamine drill. So what should we do? This is what uh, will be running. These are the questions which will be running in our mind. So how do we decide on it? So just going to the basics, um, just deviating, uh, deviating away from our clinical uh, uh, scenario. So what are we uh, thinking about uh, in uh, subconscious level? So is the cardiac output adequate? So as I told, there is no cardiac or, uh, output, normal out, uh, cardiac output. It is going to be whether adequate or not. So what do we have to uh, know? Is the blood flow adequate to meet the metabolic demands? So okay, if it is not, is it what is the pump function? How is the heart? And uh, is there adequate intravascular volume? Is the preload good in the other sense? And driving pressure for the venous, is the tank filled up? Um, is there any increased afterload? So this is what we need to know. To know about that, we should know about the left and right ventricular function, literally the heart function. And particularly, we are more worried always about the left ventricular ejection fraction. Then uh, we need to know whether uh, the patient, if the patient is intubated, or, not, or spontaneously breathing, we need to know uh, when the patient is breathing, is there a change in the uh, blood pressure or the hemodynamics? And what is the preload? Is the tank filled well? Is the patient having a good volume? Or is he losing? Uh, or if you, if you give a fluid challenge, is it going to be responding well? So this is what we need to know. So two main things, how to give fluid. Okay, we decide. Whatever it is, we always uh, decide to give a small bolus, like 250 ml. It is not going to uh, cause any deterioration. Okay, how do we uh, give fluid? Is it going to be a literal fluid bolus? Uh, sometimes it is. Uh, uh, it can be done uh, with a passive leg raise. So, uh, as you can see in the picture, the patient is uh, in a head up position. And uh, this is uh, what is done in the passive leg raising. The patient is made flat and the uh, leg side is um, lifted. So uh, this is like an auto transfusion. So uh, instead of giving a fluid bolus from outside, this patient is give, uh, given a passive leg rise. 
Okay, so bolus goes into the heart from the uh, lower part of the body. Uh, whatever pooling of blood is done, it is just given as an auto transfusion. And we always also look at the heart lung interactions if the patient is ventilated or spontaneously breathing. If the patient is taking a deep breath, what is happening to the blood pressure? So, this is what we decide to do. Okay, uh, we can give fluid, we can uh, work on it, but how to check the response? So, that is where we need the hemodynamic monitoring. So, invasive and non invasive. So, we are starting at the bedside. Uh, so, how do we uh, know how, what is the response? So, there is something called a pulse contour analysis. This is, this is one pulse uh, which is uh, seen in the arterial waveform. So, I am not talking about the invasive. I just want to go into the basics and tell you the principle of what we are thinking and uh, from where we are calculating uh, the hemodynamic monitoring values, interpreting values. So, uh, so there is a systolic uh, pressure and uh, there is a diacrotic notch and there is a diastolic um, uh, uh, pressure. So, this is uh, how a pulse looks like. So, uh, this is a systolic area. This is where uh, the whole systolic pressure acts and the systole ends. So, systolic length. Okay. And the systolic area is related to the preload and the contractility. How uh, are the how efficiently the heart can contract is what is uh, decided by the systolic area. And diastolic area, we know that uh, it accounts for the afterload. We can calculate that. And there is a mean arterial pressure, which is the uh, Okay, which is calculated with the systolic and diastolic pressure and that is inversely proportional to the compliance. So, compliance, if you give volume, how much pressure is going to increase? If with a little volume, the pressure is going to be very high, then it is bad. It is should be proportional or if you give so much volume and there is only little uh, increase in pressure, then that is also not going to help us. So, uh, we need to know the mean arterial pressure. So, this is a pulse contour analysis and this is what all the monitors uh, will look into and uh, give a calculation. So we are, uh, as uh, I, I can talk about me personally, I'm not a very um, uh, active person. I might be lazy. I just want to uh, just look into only the numbers and uh, just know, okay, the patient is okay or not. Uh, just give through blood or not because I have too many patients to see. I cannot sit and calculate uh, uh, and I'm bad in maths also. So what do I do? So this is pulse counter analysis is one principle. Next is stroke volume variation. Uh, every time we give a breath or if we give um, um, a big uh, uh, intra intrathoracic vol uh, volume, the uh, lungs expand and blood is squeezed out of the chest into the other parts of the body. So if the volume is very low, then it is going to be a very big uh, change and uh, the, it will be an exaggerated response. So, what do we do about it? Uh, so, we need to know if the blood uh, level is very low. If we give a push, it is going to be very high. And when the um, it returns to a normal volume in the intrathoracic, when that is the expiration, then the blood comes to a uh, normal level. It falls to the baseline. So, within the squeeze and uh, the let out of the uh, pressure, how much is the volume changing? So, that is the stroke volume variation. So, if it is very exaggerated, then there is going to be more response because it has much space to do that and we have space to fill the patient. That's what is interpreted. So, there will be an exaggerated drop in the stroke volume and that is what we call the stroke volume variation. So, uh, again, this is the, literally the basic of all the hemodynamic monitoring. So, I'm just repeating it. Okay. Uh, so, we are thinking about giving a fluid uh, bolus. The patient is uh, is the patient responsive. So if we give a small bolus, if the uh, if the we are giving a um, uh, fluid bolus, is the stroke volume increasing proportionately? Then that means that uh, we uh, that means that the patient has a good fluid responsiveness. But if we give a fluid response and the, the systolic volume is uh, the stroke volume is not increasing very well, then that means that. Uh, uh, compliance is bad and if we keep on giving, we are going to flood the lungs also, causing more pulmonary edema. So, we need to back off. So, we don't know. With hemodynamic monitoring, we will know whether the patient is in this part of the curve or this part of the curve. So, arterial line, we know uh, it is a continuous monitoring and we can find uh, all the traces. But uh, we also uh, did talk about, uh, Dr. Arthi did talk mention all these uh, static and dynamic parameters. Uh, I don't think I have to touch upon it again. So, it is just the pulse pressure variation. So, dynamic static, it is just a eyeballing, but dynamic means if you are giving a 
preload. If you are giving a small bonus, how much it is, uh, how much it is changing is what is the dynamic change. So we need to look at how much it is going to change. If, if the patient is going to tolerate or not tolerate. So PA catheter, it is a very big timeline and the 1970 it was found out, it was like very exciting. Uh, there are many studies which said uh, PA catheters are good. Then slowly uh, they started saying that uh, they might be bad and now it is like from 2005 after the Pac-Man trial, uh, that is, um, that is uh, less popularity for the PA catheter. So it is slowly coming down. So beyond the PA catheter, what can we do? Before we were only dependent on the PA catheters, uh, and we know that there was, uh, like uh, from Dr. Arti's lecture, we, we just heard about the cardiac output monitoring and how it was done. Now, if there is no PA catheter, how are we going to go about? So, there are other invasive monitoring like LITCO, PITCO, where there is a central and arterial line put in and uh, uh, slowly it became minimally invasive. Now, uh, in this talk, I just want to uh, just touch upon all the non-invasive hemodynamic monitoring and with the principles. I don't want to sit and talk about each and everything in detail uh, because it is like fast changing. Uh, one Every year there are new equipments coming. So it is better if we know only the principles and know how to interpret the values just with uh, uh, basic knowledge. So echocardiography, this is going to be there for uh, uh, for many years together. Uh, either it is transthoracic or transesophageal. There is also a Doppler ultrasound uh, which we'll be talking about it. Then uh, pulse wave uh, form analysis, uh, uh, PITCO, LICCO are minimally invasive. Flow track is also the same. It has arterial, it needs an arterial line in situ. And uh, we also have ele electric impedance cardiography. And uh, we have uh, other NICO, which uses uh, the indirect fit principle and bioreactants and next fin. So echocardiography, I'm sure you all have seen bedside echocardiographic machine, ultrasound machines with the basically an echo probe. So it has made our life easier. So we can, um, uh, just to know the basics, this is a probe which has a uh, metal outer casing and uh, this is a power cable that goes to the machine. This is on the patient's side. This is, a, this is a, called the plastic nose. So it has a rubber uh, coating and it has a, this is the most important part of the probe. It's a piezoelectric crystal, okay? So th this is used to monitor the patient. So the principle is that when there is a movement uh, that can, uh, which is uh, sound, ultrasound is changed to a movement of uh, the, uh, the small crystals and these crystals change and show as an electric signal. So this is what is seen in the screen of the ultrasound machine. So what are the echo windows? We have this parasternal, epical and subcostal view. Sorry about the numbering. This is parasternal, this is epical and this is subcostal. So we divide the heart into short axis plane and long axis and in apical we can see the four chamber view. So uh, just to put all these uh, uh, into one, one uh, uh, slide, this is a schematic uh, diagram. This is how the probe is placed in the left parasternal region. The pointer will be pointing towards the right shoulder. This is a cardiac probe and uh, cardiac probe uh, uh, should be uh, properly placed over the um, left intercostal space in the, this is, a, if, uh, if placed with a pointer towards the right shoulder, it is going to show the parasternal long axis view. So it is very, very important. We can see that this is the right ventricle. This is the left ventricle. This is the left atrium. So uh, left atrium, left ventricle, this is the mitral valve. This is the right ventricle outlet actually. Uh, yes, we can uh, uh, see the aorta here and the aortic valve. So this is a cross section. Here we can see that uh, there is a, a iota, descending iota. So this gives us uh, the ejection fraction. We can see how much uh, LVOT we can measure. We can uh, we can uh, measure how much of a volume time integral. These are all fancy terms, but it is basically to calculate the cardiac output. So we all know that left ventricle will uh, contract to eject blood through this. So if we measure the velocity and how much uh, the aortic valve is opening and how much of uh, blood is um, ejected through the aorta, we can find out the cardiac output. It is literally uh, in uh, proper English, only that we are measuring in this view. And we can see the contractility. This is a short axis view, the same uh, probe, same place. If you just rotate to 90 degree and the probe marker is towards the left shoulder, then we will get an image like this. So this is a cross section of a left ventricle. We can see the muscle mass. 
and we can also see the right ventricle. And if the right ventricle pressure is very high, then we can uh, um, see that it can be pressing over the left ventricle. So this is a normal uh, uh, patient, a normal heart. So that we don't see any any uh, different or a, a pathological feature. So this is how a parastolar short axis is seen. In this, we can see how the papillary muscles are there, how the heart is contracting. And uh, this is the four chamber view. Uh, we can see that it is in the apex and the pointer is towards the left shoulder again. So uh, we can see the right ventricle, left ventricle, right atrium and left atrium. And uh, we can uh, just rotate, uh, do some adjustments and see a descending aorta and pulmonary veins also. So this is a subcostal view. This is also very important because we can see the liver and the right ventricle. If there is any pericardial effusion, cardiac tamponade, we can see through this. So if there is a cardiogenic shock, if the pump is not, this is basically looking at the pump. Uh, is the heart uh, uh, the reason for the hypotension? If the LV uh, ejection fraction is low, we can uh, we can see whether there is an obstructive shock. If there is a pericardial tamponade, uh, we can just put the probe on the machine. No fancy extra um, uh, monitors are required. Just with this echo probe, we can monitor how much of uh, um, uh, ejection fraction the left ventricle is having, or is there any disturbance to the heart, and uh, is it pumping very well? So this is a very, very famous thing we do in our ICU bedside. We just put the probe in the subcostal region and with the uh, probe marker towards the head, towards the chin. So there we can see that uh, there is the intra, uh, inferior vena cava, the liver. We can also see the hepatic vein, inferior vena cava, right atrium. If we see the blood vessel connected to the right atrium, then it is inferior vena cava. Sometimes it is confused with the aorta also. So this is basically monitoring the fluid level, how, uh, like uh, the volume in the patient. If the IVC collapses very well during uh, the breathing, deep breathing, then we know that uh, the patient can accommodate more fluids. If we see something like this and the IVC is uh, full, then we must think twice before giving the fluid. And uh, next to this, we always do a lung ultrasound to see for B lines. So I have not put any images for a B lines, but. Um, if there are B lines, we do not give fluids. Uh, we just uh, uh, make sure uh, the, uh, the patient is not overloaded. So if the IVC is full, but uh, the pa patient's uh, lung ultrasound is better and it doesn't have B lines, which is evidence of increased fluid overload, then uh, we can give more fluids. So that is how we use the echo probe uh, at the bedside. So then comes the TTE. Uh, here we have all the modes 2D, M mode and Doppler, we can be used and the echo contrast 3D images also can be seen in this and uh, all the LV dimensions we can measure manually or automatically. This is basically like a, a Ryle's tube or a endoscopy, we just put it, uh, put the probe uh, into the esophagus and we see from the back side of the heart and uh, with uh, Calculations there and with measurements, uh, it just gives the cardiac output and other hemodynamic parameters. But the limitations is uh, we, it need, we need a good window. It cannot be to, kept there uh, for uh, uh, time immodial. We cannot just continuously monitor. We can just uh, keep for some time till the surgery is over and take it out. So this is what the TEE. We get the transgastric views. Uh, it is very close to the heart and aorta. Better images are seen. Real time, we can see that how the heart is getting pumped. Is there any inf uh, infective endocardial phase changes? Is there any vegetation at the wall? This is basically how the health of the heart is, how good it is beating, or is it able to pump adequate uh, blood? So it is invasive, it needs sedation, and only a skilled operator can do. Um, so it is not like we can. Um, it, it, cannot be done by everybody as the transthoracic echo. So then comes, uh, okay, this uh, to our echo cardio, uh, then we look at the Doppler. Doppler is always the flow of blood. So in the aorta, how it flows? How is the blood flow? Uh, that is that is going to uh, measure the cardiac output. Uh, so stroke volume is what we decided uh, to measure. So stroke volume into heart rate is the cardiac output. So in this uh, Doppler, we can uh, measure the outflow of the heart. Everywhere, hemodynamic monitoring, all the monitors are concentrated at the aortic root. So that is where they take the cross-sectional area, which is measured uh, along with the moment of blood and the time in which it moves, uh, it takes to move, and the SV is calculated. 
So this is what I told you, stroke volume and heart rate, how much time it is there and uh, it gives us cardiac output uh, uh, directly, we can get a number on the screen. So uh, it is like it is not going to be, uh, uh, there is no need for a picture monitor continuous, it is lesser cost, so it is going to be there. So this is uh, how it looks and uh, this is a monitor and we can see the Doppler flow, how much it is and when the trace is done, uh, and uh, we enter the heart rate, it is also measuring the heart rate and uh, stroke volume is calculated, we can see the cardiac output given there. So with the cardiac output, it is not one value, uh, we can see the trend how it is, we can also see in the graph how it is changing with the fluid bolus or uh, how the patient is responding to anesthesia or any medication in that uh, uh, part of discussion. Okay, so this is how it looks, it is a USCOM transducer. So, USCOM is ultrasonic cardiac output monitoring. So, the transducer is fed, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's non-invasive, it's a non-imaging Doppler. It is not going to image. It is just a, a waveform which is seen. The flow velocity is measured from the aortic root. And we have to keep it in the suprasternal notch. And uh, there will be a sharp, well-defined waveform in the monitor. And that is uh, the cross-sectional values predicted or measured by the transducer. And uh, the, the cardiac output is calculated uh, along with the uh, cross-sectional area flow on the heart rate. So that is how it gives us a value. So next is uh, TICO. Uh, this is uh, a trans esophageal cardiac output monitor. So the, this is ultrasonic, uh, which we saw previous is the ultrasonic cardiac output monitor. This is trans esophageal cardiac output monitor. This is also a non-imaging. So we are not going to see any images uh, from the mid esophagus. The probe is placed in the mid esophagus. In TT, in TEE, where, when, where we put the transthoracic, uh, sorry, the transesophageal probe into the esophagus, we see the images. But in this, we see only the Doppler, and it is a similar way as uh, the US commerce. It is this is minimally invasive. We think rice tube or endoscopy is invasive, then it is invasive. But this is um, it is uh, it can be left there for some time, and we can see whether the patient is having a hypo hypovolemia or uh, what is the percentage of descending uh, aorta flow changes in certain conditions, uh, which uh, when uh, spinal is given, it, this can be used in the operation data when there is a high risk surge. So when we give fluid, uh, when, we, when we look at the cardiac contractility, what is the change? Uh, so we can see a lot of changes and only graph is given. We do not see any images. So this is how it does seem. So the, uh, the probe, we can see it is placed in the uh, patient uh, esophagus. It is looking at the heart. We are not going to get any images. We are going to get a only Doppler graphs. So this is there. And we can see that, again, the cardiac output is monitored. We can see that uh, the change in how it reflects on the blood flow. Every time a, um, a blood crosses the aortic uh, valve, uh, the root of the aortic valve, it is seen like this. So a lot of, lot of uh, variations and parameters are seen. So flow time is very, very important. The flow time is measured uh, and it is, uh, it is the FTC which is important. And this uh, FTC is corrected as per uh, and adjusted to the heart rate of 60 beats per minute. So this is how it looks. How are we, are we going to interpret? This is going to be the baseline. If uh, we give fluid and uh, if uh, the uh, stroke... Uh, uh, diastole increases, then it is going to be a uh, favorable response. Yes, everything increases. We can see the flow FTC also getting increased. And we see the graph. So for this, the diagnosis is possible hypovolemia. So we give fluid and there is a positive fluid response. But in this, we can see that the, uh, the flow is not very good. Uh, so uh, the stroke volume uh, is uh, very, very um, low and it's blunted. So when we start ilotrop, we can see that the blunting effect is gone and the, the, the flow is improved. This is how uh, we see images on the monitor. So this is also a non-invasive cardiac output monitoring. This uses the fixed principle. Uh, in this, the indicator is carbon dioxide. So exhaled is CO2. So as we see, we can uh, put uh, this probe on the uh, ventilatory circuit and we can see something like this. So carbon dioxide, how it changes, what is the cardiac output is all measured and given as a number. So fixed principle, uh, the gas leaving or entering the lung depends on the blood flow through the lungs and the arteriovenous difference. So uh, we uh, can kind of uh, look at the monitor and find out how it is. Uh, 
and um, and uh, this is the capnostat that the carbon dioxide sensor and this is the rebreathing well so we know that uh, there is a nipo loop and uh, this is adjusted so we uh, have a monitor which is fit here and it has the cable which goes to the monitor and numbers are displayed there nipo is non invasive cardiac output monitor so there are calculation done in this partial rebreathing system and uh, displayed as numbers so uh, then we go for the electrical impedance so we know uh, that uh, there is uh, interaction between heart and lung when there is increased uh, uh, intrathoracic volume when there is the inspiration the blood flow changes and when there is uh, exhalation the blood flow changes so there are sensors put on the chest and it is all monitored with the impedance how it is transmitting current and everything is put over the um, monitor so uh, this is impedance versus bioreactance it is not very sensitive it is not widely used it is just in the trial phase so we just need to know about it so it is very difficult to set up and every small noise um, causes an issue and it is not full proof so that's why i just mentioned it we need to know what it is but uh, it is it is not invasive yes but it is not very um, a very uh, trustworthy as of now and this is uh, one of the latest thing which we might see in our ot soon so this is a non invasive monitor cnap we call it uh, this is uh, uh, it is like a, a blood pressure cuff over the fingers so we can see that there is continuous monitoring of uh, arterial pulses and uh, with all the variations the pulse counter analysis everything put together there is a multiple control mechanism with this uh, the, there are a lot of uh, variables or parameters displayed on the monitor so this is coming up soon uh, i think in, uh, uh, in the intraoperative monitoring this is going to be uh, very um, uh, popular but in icu patients it is still under study and it is not uh, uh, advised uh, to use this in uh, patients who are very sick and in uh, um, uh, severe shock states so evidence yes we have a lot of uh, studies uh, which have been done comparing cardiac output and blood volumes in uh, uh, by ultrasound dilution and uh, transpulmonary thermo dilution all these uh, uh, methods have been compared and uh, there have been cross comparisons with lipco pitco flow track uh, pac catheters there are a lot of pitfalls in hemodynamic monitoring no uh, we cannot uh, take one hemodynamic monitoring and say that it is enough for the patient one variable is not enough for the patient so um, there have been a lot of pitfalls which have been studied and uh, slowly uh, the evidence of minimally invasive is helping in perioperative setting yes but in icu still studies are going on and uh, all this uh, uh, odm transpulmonary dilution which looks very uh, very promising and uh, uh, is uh, odm is esophageal uh, uh, this doppler monitor and but it needs for the evaluation in sepsis or any other forms of shock uh, it is uh, not uh, going to help very much still invasive holds the first place and the priority uh, because nobody is uh, uh, willing to uh, just look at the non invasive and say that things are right because it is life or death situation in the icu so there had been a lot of protocols flow charts but whatever it is it is it is uh, it needs more study there are uh, not much of an outcome benefits and even with the protocolized uh, algorithms uh, we can see that uh, the output benef uh, outcome benefits are not so high and uh, intensivists by their personal uh, choice they are uh, looking into at least minimal minimally invasive uh, cardiac monitoring they are not at totally uh, it is like uh, put on auto uh, auto pilot mode uh, thinking that non invasive is good but in ot's uh, where the patient is going for a high risk surgery and the patient is not very sick uh, pre operatively then Uh, there are um, and uh, the surgeons are very happy uh, if the anesthetists use the non invasive methods so what next so we have all these things invasive non invasive put together so what what next so there are many modalities available uh, which are non invasive or minimally invasive uh, challenging the pa catheter is uh, still a big issue because um, even now we know that uh, cardiac surgeons are comfortable in putting a pa catheter and watching it and uh, uh, can use them as initial modality in appropriate patients yes uh, we know uh, we have to be very selective which uh, hemodynamic monitor to use for which patient is very very important and uh, uh, if there are not much of a response uh, then we can change over to more invasive pa catheter 
and as i already said esophageal doppler monitor is gaining popularity in uh, in um, uh, western countries it is being used in almost all the patients undergoing uh, um, um, high risk surgeries so limitations are there uh, we cannot differentiate between the pulmonary edema yes we always look at the cardiac output uh, yes how is changing yes but is the lungs or the lungs getting wet is what we need to think about it uh, the tolerance is not much and if there is a septic shock it is going to hurt the patient again uh, we don't know there can be a non cardiogenic pulmonary edema also ards patients it's quite tricky and uh, if it is combined goal directed intra uh, fluid management it reduces the pre op mortality but more studies are uh, still awaited so points to be noted in everything uh, in hemodynamic monitoring as a whole tachycardia is never a good thing we cannot just avoid uh, tachycardia and hypotension is not always pathological and uh, there is no normal cardiac output cvp is elevated only uh, only elevated in disease uh, higher mortality was shown in patients with right ventricular dysfunction we are always uh, uh, somehow fixed with the left ventricle uh, function only but we need to have a very good uh, um idea and we must also know that right ventricular mortality dysfunction mortality is higher than the left ventricle so uh, we have to have more devices looking at right ventricle also so to summarize no monitoring device even if it is simple or complex or it is invasive or non invasive it is going to be very accurate or precise so whatever it is it cannot be improving the outcome it is the judgment and the treatment and the doctor uh, or the medical treating team makes the difference in improving the outcome because it should be judiciously used just because it is available uh, we cannot put a esophageal doppler monitor on all the patients and take whatever numbers uh, are there as a pool proof and uh, if it is uh, going to be a pa catheter we must have very uh, clear uh, protocol protocol for using that and uh, it cannot be just put in auto mode there has to be a bedside personalized care that is going to improve outcome and not only the gadgets so um, yes after a long lecture after think, uh, talking about hemodynamic monitoring uh, it is very uh, sad to say but uh, hemodynamic monitors are not uh, the only way uh, to improve patients it is just a guide and judicious um, use of the hemodynamic monitors and the knowledge proper knowledge and interpretation is going to help the patient more than the monitor itself thank you Thank you, Madam Rajesh. Thank, thank you, thank you very much, Madam, for that uh, excellent lecture and a uh, lot of newer advances you have shared with us. And uh, the take home message was very, very nice. That uh, what you have delivered. Uh, some few questions, Madam. Uh, yes. Non-invasive blood pressure monitoring in morbidly obese patient. Uh, where if if you if you don't have a proper uh, cuff size, so how to tackle that situation? In obese patients, uh, it is uh, it is very important. Uh, we can use a thigh cuff. Sir. Thigh cuffs are available. We have used on patients, uh, but if it is not uh, giving a good seal or uh, what I had told already, eighty percent, if it is not covering, then we have to go in for an intra-arterial uh, blood pressure monitor. It depends on how sick the patient is. Just the patient came for observation, and we cannot be doing uh, uh, invasive arterial uh, monitoring. and uh, manual uh, blood pressure monitoring is also very important so we need to know the trend even if we have a nibp uh, we have to do a manual to see whether it is correlating with the nibp of the obese patients perfusion index in uh, hemodynamic monitoring the perfusion index in pulse oximetry perfusion index perfusion index okay so uh, it is it is also under study only sir because if there is peripheral vasoconstriction in the pulse oximeter if we look at uh, the peripheral uh, perfusion index or it is it going to correlate and in old patient particularly when there is vasoconstriction and uh, in uh, icu we know the temperature is very cold and there is vasoconstriction even due to the environmental change uh, so everything put together we cannot uh, use perfusion index as uh, full proof it is also just under study it is not uh, it is not uh, regularly used in icu or ots Uh, non invasive cardio cardiac output monitoring which one will be uh, most ideal technique at uh, current scenario non invasive cardiac output it depends on the uh, scenario uh, as uh, dr rp also said which patient uh, uh, which monitor you use for which patient so in uh, in uh, particularly ot's uh, this esophageal doppler monitoring is very very uh, popular nowadays uh, 
so they just place it so that they can know whether the fluid is given because we do not have access to the chest when they are doing a big hepatectomy or they are just doing a big laparotomy we cannot cross you know the barrier will be always that between anesthetist and surgeon so you cannot always cross and get the echo done so if there is going to be and uh, trans esophageal uh, echo also cannot be placed for a longer time but this is like a small raised tube so i know it is a bit costly but it is worth uh, the cost so if they keep the uh, esophageal uh, monitor in place the doppler gives us a lot of variations and uh, the trend when we use the fluid only thing is we will be not knowing about how much we tolerate the so if a lot of fluids and particularly in liver surgery the surgeons might want us to just go low on the fluid um, uh, thing also so we use vasopressors but in, in between this uh, uh, fluids and uh, uh, diuresis we don't know how much the lung is getting affected so only one problem otherwise if the patient's lung is better there is no pulmonary edema uh, feature the heart is good then it is not going to uh, be a very big uh, problem using uh, esophageal monitor Thank you, madam. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, madam. We will move on to the next uh, presentation. Uh, Central venous uh, cannulation by Dr. Sasi Mayuka, who is a consultant critical care physician from uh, Vijaya Hospital, Chennai. Um, she is also uh, highly passionate towards critical care medicine because I know her from her postgraduate days when she joined postgraduation in anesthesiology. The first thing what she told us is, I am going to become an intensivist and right now she is an intensivist. Welcome Sasi Mayuka, you can uh, deliver your... Uh, Thank you, sir. You can share your slides. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to uh, talk to you about central venous incursion. Uh, so, a few things about I'm going to talk about is the equipment which will be required, what are the sterile precautions which will be needed, and the technique of insertion. So, now moving on to the topic. As the previous uh, presenters have already told about central venous line, the importance of CVP measurement, I'll brush through the first few slides, and then we'll go on to the demo. So, if you see why central or peripheral route. So usually the selection depends upon the type of fluid, the medications to be administered and the length of time access. Because this is very important in an ICU setup when the patient comes, when you have to give a lot of inotropic support, when you need dialysis, you need a central access than a peripheral route. So the indications for short term will be fluid, electrolyte administration, high volume of blood transfusion, to monitor the central venous pressures and to give chemotherapy drugs and for giving uh, TPN. So what are the types of central venous catheters which are available? There are non-tunnel central catheters, tunnel central catheters, peripherally inserted central catheters and implantable ports. The most common which we use in an ICU setup or an OT setup is the non-tunnel central catheter. What are the three access sites which are available? It is the internal jugular vein, the subclavian vein, or the femoral vein. So how do we decide if a patient comes whether to use the internal jugular, the subclavian, or the femoral vein? All of these have pros and cons. All of them have a lot of advantages and disadvantages. So depending upon each patient, we have to decide whether we go for an IJV cannulation or for a femoral cannulation. What are the equipments required for the central line insertion? You need a sterile tray with sterile instruments, gown and drape, sterile gloves, caps and masks. The skin preparation should be done either with 70% alcohol or 10% covalent iron solution or 2 to 4% pure hexidin. But now what in ICU setup we all of us use is pure hexidin solution. So this is how a patient should be draped because sterile precautions are very important for central line insertion because the clapsy, the catheter related infections are very high because of the uh, aseptic precaution uh, because of the aseptic 
precautions are not strictly followed. This is the center like equipment. This, I think all of you would have seen, this is the kit which will be available to us. So as you can see in this slide, you can see there is a needle which is required for uh, the venous insertion. This is the guide wire. This is the scalpel which is required. And here you can see there are three lumens. This is a central line catheter with three lumens. There'll be one 16 gauge and two, 18, uh, uh, two 16 gauge and one 18 gauge for IV fluids or blood transfusions. And this is the dilator which will be used for dilatation. So what is the procedure which we do? So first, as I was telling you in the previous slides, the sterile preparation, the landmarking of the access site. After which you have to depend on, uh, uh, next is moving on to is the anesthesia. If the patient is on ventilator, patient is already on sedation, we can directly go ahead and place the line. In case patient is awake, conscious, before doing all this, we have to explain to the attenders that we uh, explain to the attenders, get consent for the central line uh, access, and then patient, before two uh, ways you can do this procedure. A one is landmark guided, one is ultrasound guided. The landmark guided procedures have been slowly moving out of date and all of us have moved towards ultrasound guided procedures. Mostly in the OT setup and ICU setup, we have moved towards ultrasound guided procedures. In the next coming slides, I'll tell you how we do an ultrasound and how we identify the vein. So after we identify the vein, the introducer needle will be placed in the vein and then you have to check whether it's a venous or an arterial blood. After that, you have to insert the guide wire remove the needle, place the skin incision, and then dilate the axis, and then place the catheter. After placing the catheter, you have to be very careful to remove the guide wire, after which you have to flush and cap the lumens and secure the catheter. Two important things is here I marked it in red because there are a lot of incidences where the insertion of the guide wire, if it is not going freely, do not push the guide wire because your Access may not be in the right location. So make sure that the, there is blood free aspirate of the blood before you insert the guide wire. And if there's any resistance while inserting the guide wire, make sure that you pause, reassess, and then you insert the guide wire. The other important step is removal of the guide wire. Because there are a lot of incidences that guide wire has been pushed inside and patient has been pushed to the cat lab to remove the guide wire. There are a lot of complications if the guide wire is left in place. This is a pictorial de uh, demonstration which I was telling you earlier. This is, you can see there is an aspirate of blood when the, the needle is inserted into the vein, after which a guide wire has to be inserted through the needle. Then the guide wire has, guide wire will be there and the needle will be removed. After which, through a, you have to place a dilator. After the pathway is dilated, then you insert the catheter and then the guide wire should be removed then all the three lumens should be capped. So the three approaches which I was telling about the internal jugular, femoral and subclavian. Uh, we'll be discussing in the next five minutes the advantages and disadvantages of each approach. For the internal jugular approach, right side, right side approach is preferred and you can place the patient in Trendelenburg position. The head should be slightly turned to the opposite side. The needle placement is a triangle formed by the clavicle and the sternal and clavicular heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, after which the needle should be placed at 30 to 40 degrees to the skin and lateral the ipsilateral nipple under the medial image of, uh, of uh, the internal jugular vein. Here you can see this is the internal jugular vein. This is the carotid artery. How do we differentiate between this? Either using a color doppler or you can do a compressibility test. When you try to compress, the veins are always collapsible. So you can see if you compress this, the internal jugular will collapse 
So you, it's easier for us to identify that this is the internal jugular vein. In this, you can see the needle will be entering into the internal jugular vein. This is a small demonstration video of how internal jugular landmark guided approach has been done. With the patient in the supine position, locate the important anatomical landmarks. Palpate the carotid pulsation and identify the anterior and posterior heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Make certain you can identify these landmarks before proceeding further. Here, the physician. So once after you've identified the landmark, then you have to do, uh, here they've used covidin iron, but now we've moved on to use floor You can make the sternocleidomastoid more visible by having the patient rotate his head to the contralateral side and flex his neck. Once the betadine is dry, place a sterile dressing on the patient. Local anesthesia. So and as I was telling you, you, after this, you must maintain constant negative pressure on the advancing. So after this, you can see they're giving uh, they're giving a local anesthesia at this place, and then they're locating the vein. So once you can see, just pause it for you people to see. So you can see the color of the blood is dark color and the flow will be, uh, there will not be an arterial pulsation. So this is for us to identify that this uh, needle is in the internal jugular vein. So here you can see after the needle is placed, the, they're threading the guide wire through this needle. After they've threaded the guide wire, they are removing the needle. So once the needle is removed, they're placing an incision at the place. So once the incision has been placed, then you then you dilate the say uh, dilate through the guide wire. So he is inserting the dilator. So you have to make sure always the guide wire is pulled out and the guide wire is held with one of the hand when you insert it. So you can see here, he is always holding the guide wire and the guide wire is always outside. So after it is done, the catheter is inside and then you have to check for the back flow. Once you have checked for the back flow of the uh, catheter, in this, it is because the landmark guided, they are checking like this. If it is, if we have done ultrasound guided, we can see the catheter insertion through the ultrasound real imaging and after it is done also we can check if the catheter is in the jugular vein. After which suturing has to be done, both the sides suturing has to be done. See, tight suturing has to be done, one, two and three. See, all these suturing has to be done. So once you place the once you place the internal jugular catheter or center line or a dialysis catheter, we have to take an X-ray to confirm the position of the internal uh, of the catheter. So here you can see the catheter right sitting into the junction of the SVC and RA. The, the other things which you can do instead of an X-ray is you can do an ultrasound screening to see where the uh, catheter is. The next thing is for looking for pneumothorax because that is the most important complication after the internal jugular vein or a subclavian cannulation. So to rule out a pneumothorax, instead of taking an X-ray, we can do a lung ultrasound to see if there's any lung sliding present or absent. If the lung sliding is absent, that means patient has pneumothorax and it is hydrogenic because we have caused the pneumothorax because of the central line cannulation. 
So next, moving on to the advantages and the disadvantages of internal jugular. The anatomy is readily visible for us with ultrasound. Easily access surface to the patient. What are the most important disadvantages? Are there a function of the internal carotid can happen and pneumothorax can happen. Next, moving on to the subclavian approach. So, in the subclavian approach, also right side is preferred. As for both the internal jugular and the subclavian, why did I say right side is preferred? Because most common thing is in the left side. The length of the catheter has to be used when you have to do because of a longer length required. The other thing is injury to the thoracic duct. In the subclavian approach, the supine position, head neutral with arm should be abducted and shoulder should be neutral with mild retraction. The needle placement will be the junction of the middle and medial thirds of the clavicle and the small tubercle in the medial del uh, deltopectoral groove. Needle should be parallel to the skin and it should be aimed aims towards the supraclavicular notch and just under the clavicle. So here you can see it is just under the clavicle. You go straight, hit the groove and go below it and aim towards the sternal notch. Evidence suggests that the risk of major central venous lump. So this is, the, uh, this is a representation of the subclavian approach. Here you can see this is the subclavian artery and this is the subclavian vein. So as I was telling you, you have to palpate for the clavicle. So after you palpate for the clavicle and the sternal notch, go below the injunction between the medial two third and the lateral one third, go below it and then aim towards the sternal notch. So once there is a blood aspirate, this is the triple lumen catheter which we were talking earlier. The same thing has to be placed here also. So here you can see how he is accessing the subclavian vein. So once he inserts into it, blood is aspirated. The same thing here also, the blood should be dark in color and there should not be any pulsatile flow. After which, a guide wire will be inserted into the line. Needle will be removed. Then placing an incision with the scalpel and then the dilator will be passed over the guide wire. So once the dilator is passed the guide wire, here you can see how he is dilating it. The rotatory movements are very important in dilating any vein. After you have dilated it, then pass the catheter over the guide wire. Place caps on the hose and secure the line in place. Apply a sterile dressing before removing the drain. So here you can see how he placed the sterile dressing, which I was telling you in the earlier. Secure the line in place. Apply a sterile dressing before removing the drain. Obtain a chest x-ray to assess for proper placement and to assure that no hemothorax or pneumothorax has occurred. All sharps should be properly disposed in approved sharps containers. Scalpels should be retracted into their protective sleeves. Needle stick injury can be minimized by using needle lock devices found in most commercial central line kits. Sterile dressing should be placed on the insertion site. The dressing should be changed daily, and whatever blood or liquid accumulates or it loses its seal 
So regarding the advantages of subclavian vein, there is a lower risk of infection, does not require movement of patient's head and can be assessed during C-spine immobilization. It is useful in emergency. The most important thing is the subclavians are preferred because of the lower risk of infection. But the other disadvantage is it has higher chances of pneumothorax, the puncture of the tracheostomy or the ET tube cuff, and you cannot apply pressure to stop bleeding. So when a patient comes in emergency, when patient PTINR are elevated, when patient is in septic shock bleeding, we usually prefer the internal jugular or the femoral vein because the chance, because if it bleeds, we'll have access to stop by applying pressure. Next is the femoral approach. So position is supine. Needle placement is medial to the femoral artery. Needle should be held at 45 degree angle and skin insertion should be 2 cm below the inguinal ligament. And you have to aim towards the umbilicus. Here you can see this is the femoral vein, this is the femoral artery and this is the femoral nerve. So the vein is the medial most structure. So here you can see this is the inguinal ligament. This is the femoral vein. This is an ultrasound image of showing which is this is the femoral artery and this is the femoral vein. As I was telling you earlier, the femoral vein will be compressible. When you try to compress, the femoral vein is getting compressed. Here you can see in this picture. So this is how you can differentiate. Otherwise, you can use a color doppler also to differentiate between the femoral vein and the femoral artery. Safest vein to place large lines, for example, veno vena hemofiltration, usually they use it for ECMO. Femoral artery puncture can lead to retroperitoneal bleed. Femoral nerve damage can occur. And the most important disadvantage of a femoral vein is highest chance of infection. So usually we do not prefer femoral veins until it is a very, very emergency. So after we place the catheter, what is the post-catheter placement? What are the steps to be done? Aspirate blood from each port and check. Flush with saline or sterile water and do not use heparin. Secure catheter with sutures. Cover with sterile dressing. Obtain chest x-ray for IJV and subclavian lines. And write a procedure note. So always remember, after placing all these, procedure note is very important and documentation is very important. So the name of the procedure, indication, and how many pricks you have done should also be mentioned. So as I was talking to you earlier, the ultrasound guided central venous axis has become the standard of care now. Veins are compressible. Vein is accessed under direct visualization, and it is very helpful in patients with difficult anatomy. Uh, in, before we start on to do a cannulation, we have to always check whether there is a thrombus, whether the veins are compressible, because there are a lot of patients who are chronic renal failure patients who would have had multiple dialysis lines inserted and the veins would have been thrombosed. This is a small video to show that you can see a thrombus over there. So here you can see a lot of psychogenic structures, the thrombus. This is when a patient who was multiple times catheter was placed for dialysis because a fistula could not be done for the patient. So here you can see the thrombus, the echogenic structures which are moving around. So always remember before doing any ultrasound cannulation, screen for the vein and see if there are any echogenic structures or it is compressible. So this is again a recap of what we have been talking. So first confirm the anatomy, after which use an ultrasound probe to see the location. Then you are with the ultrasound, puncture the vein. Then the guide wire has to be inserted. After the guide wire inserted, use a dilator to dilate it. Remove the dilator, place the catheter, aspirate and see if there is blood flow in all the three sites after which it has to be capped and a sterile dressing has to be placed. So as I was talking about dressing of the site, use either sterile gauze or a semi-permeable dressing. You need not replace the dressing daily, but if it's a gauze dressing which you are going to do, you have to replace it every two days. 
but if there are transparent dressings it can be changed every 7 days but in case if there is a soiling of the dressing it has to be changed immediately so insertion related complications it, they can be pneumothorax chylothorax hemothorax cardiac arrhythmias air embolus arterial puncture and nerve injury mechanical related complications are post poor catheter placement it can be high end up or it can be very low down phlebitis thrombosis and catheter occlusion can occur infection related there can be a catheter insertion site related infection a tunneling there can be a subcutaneous infection it can be colonization and bacteria so the summary vascular access devices are very important because in an any any emergency condition for giving high inotropic support fluids in trauma resuscitation we might need central line accesses or dialysis line accesses if patient comes with high potassium levels we need immediate so very important is the device and the site selection uh, i forgot to tell you about the catheter sizes usually the central line catheters which we use are 7 cm catheters and the dialysis line catheters the right sided igv catheters are 13 french and the left sided igv catheters are 16 french so device site and size are very important after all these have been done nursing care is more important because high chances of central line catheter infections have come and once that infection is that patient goes into bacteremia sepsis and then we'll not be able to use that access anymore so we have to remove the lines and recite the lines so in any emergency condition if these signs are placed it has to be recited as early as possible thank you thank you uh, thank you dr sasi for the presentation we have uh, some questions here yes sir uh, so why you are emphasizing that the heparin should not be used so because there are high chances of bleeding in sepsis patients sir and heparin is not required for line flushing sir only saline flushing is enough sir to maintain the patency of the lines okay uh, can we use ejv instead of igv in critically ill patients for uh, we can use ejv sir but if the access is enough if you are not patient is not requiring dialysis or anything we can use ejv itself only for inotropic support if there's a worsening inotropic support when patient is going to require dialysis instead of all putting an ejv directly we can put a triple lumen so that we can use it both for dialysis for fluid resuscitation for inotropic support otherwise if you put a right ejv already then you have to place a left sided line sir and patient is very sick so left sided ej uh, left side igv in place you need to use a longer catheter there are more chances of thoracic duct injury and everything in an emergency situation when you're doing it so usually we prefer right sided igv and in case we are going to place an igv initially till we place the line and everything we used to use a left sided igv for initial starting and then we move on to right sided igv uh, central line placement in anticoagulated patients in anticoagulated in anticoagulated patients depending on the emergency sir we usually look into the platelet count and ptinr values if the platelet count is less than 50000 we if the patient uh, if the patient requires a dialysis line and the platelet count is less than 50000 we prefer to transfuse and then place a dialysis line oh, what about uh, uh, for central uh, not dialysis catheter central line and then either we do it till platelet count of 20000 okay uh, uh, now what is the size of the catheter which you seven french catheters sir no why uh, 13 french catheter for uh, right igv and 16 french catheters for left igv during dialysis during dialysis because of the uh, svc ra junction the catheter tip has to be there sir. so when it comes from the left side the catheter tip is high up so the flows will be uh, the flows when you do during dialysis it gets stuck sir if it is not in the right position so left sided are longer to approach the junction of svc and ra so that way we use 16 french for left sided and 13 french for right sided 
thank you thank you thank you uh, you answer all the questions thank you sasi thanks thanks sir thank uh, edward sir over to you sir thank you sir thank you so the three presenters dr arthi dr pradima and dr sasi i thank uh, the today presenters excellent presentations and uh, with that we come to the end of this uh, session i thank the coordinator rajesh j prakash sir also and i thank the uh, anesthesia tv even logics and akrula for this uh, session and we will meet in the next week with an interesting topic on ventilator that is basic modes of ventilator by sandra sir thank you thank you one and all we will conclude this session thank you Thank <laughs> you.